Um, so I will give us a quick uh, introduction on, on what we're doing with the Prevent Waste Alliance um, and who we are and, and why we're doing this training today. Uh, then we'd like to just give you a, a quick uh, set of questions. So who do we have with us in the room? Uh, I think we have a very international audience with us today. Uh, and maybe just ask a few of the challenges uh, that you're facing around batteries management. What kind of batteries are you working with? What kind of organizations are you from? And then we really dive into the content, uh, which we want to learn today with Mario Champagne. Um, and we have the first hour looking at the basics, how to identify different types of batteries, how to classify and sort these. <coughs> and we'll move into the second hour, more or less, where we'll look at management of lithium ion batteries and lead acid batteries, what you need to know here. And then the third section, let's say, is looking at alkaline batteries, portable batteries, um, what you need to, to think about with regards to sorting and classifying these and, and general aspects around transport um, and collection as well. Uh, you will have noticed that you are all on mute and um, we may find a way to, to open this up later on, but uh, just to kind of avoid having any disturbances, this is the way we will approach it for now. We really welcome you to, to post questions into the chat. And as soon as you have these, you can post these. I will uh, interrupt Mario and ask if there are any uh, understanding questions um, which we need to, to answer. But we'll also be looking to have every 20 to 30 minutes uh, proper questions session as well, where we can really go into a bit more detail as well. Um, so yeah, that's more or less the program. And uh, with that, maybe I go into the next bit and present a bit what Prevent is and what we're working on. So Mario, if you could go into the next slide, please. Great. So the Prevent the Waste Alliance was launched in 2019. Next slide, please. And um, basically it was, was backed by the uh, Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development, BMZ. Um, I myself, I work at GIZ and we have the role of being the secretariat for the alliance. And we have uh, basically over 200 uh, organizations who are members now. All of the, game, the aim and the goal of wanting to minimize waste, eliminate pollutants and reutilize resources in the economy. And uh, the aim is on low and middle income countries. So how can we support waste management and circular economy in this context? Next. And I think the next slide when it comes is on uh, the working groups. So we have three working groups which we work on. Uh, the first one is plastics. Uh, so we have a lot of members uh, looking at plastics. And uh, then we have uh, a second working group looking at e-waste. And here we're trying to set up uh, activities around take back systems and find solutions for problematic e-waste fractions, for instance. This is the working group that I'm coordinating in my role. And we also have a working group on framework conditions. How can you support the development of waste management um, worldwide? We're also looking at ideas for financing mechanisms. How can we support extended producer responsibility, plastic credits, for instance, but also awareness raising and behavior change. Next. So here you can see what we're working on in the e-waste working group. We have at the moment four pilot projects. Uh, so today's uh, efforts are stemming from this pilot project working on problematic e-waste fractions. We want to find out, you know, in different contexts, how can we find solutions which can work for the most difficult to, to deal with fractions. This is batteries, refrigerators, uh, other um, fractions that are, are difficult to manage and there's often no market for them. Uh, and that's where this training is, is coming from today. We've been looking at the topic of batteries recycling um, during the last uh, two years uh, with the Lambert Group, uh, who is a Prevent member, and trying to figure out solutions for this. Uh, and today we will share some of the results from one of those projects. We have another project in Ecuador looking at um, setting up an EPR system together with the, the city of Quito and collection uh, approaches there. We're looking at e-waste compensation as a, a financing mechanism. Could it work maybe to have like a carbon credits compensation mechanism for e-waste uh, in Nigeria? Uh, and also looking at how to support the implementation of the Basel Convention in Tanzania on e-waste imports. We have other working groups looking at refurbishment and also at um, how we can improve the whole Basel Convention processes related to the prior informed consent procedure. 
So we're looking at very different topics and I invite you to take a look on the Prevent Waste Alliance website if you haven't already uh, for a bit more uh, information on that. Next. So I think with that, um, we are handing over to Mario. I don't know, Mario, was the questionnaire was after this slide probably, but I will let you start and then we can maybe um, share as well the link to <coughs> questions. Yes, I would present myself. OK, so I'm Mario Champagne. I'm a chemical engineer and I'm working for the Landbell Group, which is an organization involved in um, circular uh, economy engineering in Europe. Uh, where we manage compliance scheme for packaging, electronic waste, waste batteries. And we are also providing uh, services for corporate customer manufacturers of electronics as well. Um, I am working for many of these companies as a technical specialist, uh, working for them since 17 years. Uh, one of my main activity in the past was to audit all the suppliers uh, with which we work for the development of our uh, compliance scheme. And uh, yeah, I, I've been in many countries to see a lot of people, uh, mostly electronic waste uh, recyclers. Uh, there is less waste battery recyclers, but I've seen many of them mainly. So um, yeah, that's it mainly. This is what I, I'm doing. And I believe for the next slide, I will explain what are the learning objective of this uh, presentation. Uh, it's quite um, compact and I try to put a lot of information in it. Uh, maybe there is too much. Uh, sometimes maybe it's too much uh, uh, advanced, but uh, I will try to make it uh, easy to digest in general. Uh, but the first thing we want to do is to make sure that we understand what is a battery and how we can identify them and sorting them and why do we do this. Uh, maybe it's related to the type of job I'm doing, but I will put also some uh, a lot of uh, um, a lot of um, emphasis on the fact that you have to protect yourself, protect your employee, uh, protect the environment when you manage this type of batteries because there are some kind of uh, nasty chemical products in, involved. Uh, we will try to 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 see what you can do with those battery locally, and if not, uh, what can be done to be send them uh, to send them uh, internationally to other countries, where there are some processes plants that can manage them, uh, and also. Um, we'll try to take a look at some type of technology that would, can be used for the management of those batteries. Uh, before we begin, uh, Danielle has mute everybody, but uh, me, I'm working from home and uh, I cannot mute my dogs. I have two dogs, so it's possible that at the moment you hear some barking, so I already apologize about that. Normally they are quiet. Uh, so and that well, what we will cover and mainly also during that presentation this is the topics we will see type of batteries chemistry chemistry is identification because there are many types of batteries uh environmental health and safety aspects um we will try to cover also emergency emergency situation uh, uh, management because some problems can occur at facility with this type of batteries Collection, handling, storage, sorting, conditioning for transfer. This is all things we, we need to know to, to, to move them around eventually. There is a, a section about legal aspect for the transfer as well. Uh, what needs to be done for trans frontier shipment or annex when you use Annex 7 to send it to another country. And uh, eventually we'll talk about recycling. Uh, reuse, which is there is some interesting things you can do with this and also disposal. Starting questions. Danielle. Yes, so um, we prepared a little uh, bit of a questionnaire just for you to uh, 
also interact with us a bit. Um, so I share that into the chat. If you'd like to go and, and uh, on that link, you can um, give us a bit of feedback about which region you're from, what kind of organization you're working in, and some of your main challenges. It doesn't have to be anything too fancy here. Just sort of say, well, you know, this is this is my main challenge that I face with ma managing these batteries. And we've also put a list of uh, the main types of batteries that you might want to work with. And uh, we also invite you just to answer on this, which ones are the ones you're working with um, the most. And if you're not sure, you can just put not sure. So we just give you two minutes to take a look on that link and um, fill in some answers and then we'll share them with the group and then you have an idea where everybody is from. So please do click on this link and give us some answers. And in the meantime, Mario, I was thinking maybe you need to also put on your camera just for a moment so everybody can see you. And if you have the docs turning up, maybe this this is also some, some light entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is one that will scare you, but. <laughs> Great, so I can see some answers coming in now. But for me, at least, you're a little bit blurry, Mario. So maybe we put on the camera now just for a moment, but then afterwards we probably have to uh, turn it off again. Sorry. Otherwise, we have. I'm sorry, questions. I don't see myself. So. <laughs> but we have a dog. Another challenge that is the fact that the, the meal of the dog is normally during the presentation, so we're going to have fun. Yeah, so this is something I forgot to mention at the beginning, is that we um, will have a, a small break for five minutes uh, somewhere in the middle, maybe after the first hour, so everyone has a chance also to get, go for a toilet break and maybe grab a coffee as well. And I guess, Mario, you have a chance to feed your dog. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> I will cut my camera, maybe. Oh, I see my face. You can see we have uh, from Africa, six from Western Europe, one from Eastern Europe, one from Asia. I think this will be updating all the time, but we get an idea who we have with us. And I know many more uh, also signed up from, from Asia uh, and the Middle East as well. So um, <clears throat> see that. What type of organization are most people working in? Well, we have a number of e-waste recyclers. We also have some consulting research, a lot of innovations, but uh, maybe I'm going through the answers too fast. So we see this as it changes, but everyone can see at the same time. It's like Asia's catching up a little bit. Lots of NGOs. Looking at the batteries. Uh, um, a lot of people working on lead acid batteries. Also, lithium oxide, microcadmium and alkaline. So, actually, all of the batteries being used. And it's good to see that uh, there's a good share here. Okay, so thanks very much for just giving us a bit of an idea where everybody's from, so you also know who's on the call. Um, I don't know if we need to go into too much detail here, but uh, you can see we have a very good international uh, participant circle today. And uh, Mario, do you have any other questions about who else we have on the call? I think we have a good mix actually yes, of, uh, between recyclers, consultants, research and, and international organizations and NGOs. 
were worldwide. And um, what I forgot to do, of course, is here. So the challenges that are being mentioned, there are no disposal sites. Um, international shipment is difficult. There are small volumes in our region, meaning that we are forced to transport the batteries to Europe, which is difficult due to shipping costs and restrictions. Collection, sorting and managing is a challenge. We try to learn how to recycle our laptop batteries in a proper way. Separation of elements, purity of separated phase is low, lithium, cobalt, nickel. International trade of waste batteries and traceability challenges, sorting and storing batteries, exporting for recycling, e or battery systems in Africa, not enough know-how and solution, the lack of treatment facilities is a big problem. At the same time, transport to other countries is a great problem for the cities that we provide consultancy to. Sorting into different types, lack of downstream options for management of waste batteries, battery recycling, lack of awareness at all level and lack of recycling facilities, point of disposal, application for the waste, destination scheme and prices for it. So thanks very much for these inputs. I think, Mario, this, these are questions that we're going to be ask, answering today, right? To some extent. Yes. <laughs> yes. At the, by, at the base, you know, I, I try to make something um, accessible for almost everybody. So uh, there, is, there is maybe some points very, very specialized, that, uh, but we'll, we'll see. We'll see. So, um, so I'll let you share your screen again, and, and probably you can also turn off your camera now, just to make sure we have enough bandwidth and we can start. Yes. And where is the presentation? This one here. Yes. Uh, do you see it or no? Maybe. I don't see it yet. No, just a minute. Hey, what up? You see it now? You just need... Yep, we just need to put it in presentation mode. Yep, now we're yes. good. You're good? Okay, we start. Uh, why identified um, and sort batteries? That's one of the first questions we can ask ourselves. Uh, it's for sure there are many, many reasons uh, why we want to set up, separate those elements that you will collect eventually from uh, some sources. Uh, I assume in general that they probably will come from uh, mix uh, from a region where they are already all mixed together and then you have to, to make the best of it from yourself on your side at your facility. Um, one of the main reasons to separate the batteries is to be uh, able to have safe uh, environmentally sound management of them. Uh, mixed batteries uh, you may have inside them uh, some with acid, some with uh, risk of fire. Uh, we need to organize these uh, and different streams where they will be uh, well managed to protect uh, uh, all, all parties mainly. Also, on your side, you want to make business, uh, you want to make some money from it, so you will want as well to sort them to get some uh, revenue to get some uh, from it, some kind of uh, critical raw material that can generate for you extra value uh, or commodities like steel or um, manganese that could be sold as commodities eventually. Uh, and as we don't want to, se to sell uh, batteries to another enterprise eventually with contaminated loads that could reduce the value of it, then you want to make good sorting of them. Uh, there is also the fact that, uh, like in Europe, when we sort batteries, there is one of the main reasons as well is that each type of battery uh, will find its own process at the moment, at the end of life. Uh, some of them, each process will allow the removal of some kind of contamination and also maximize the recovery of the elements. Uh, sorting is uh, something quite easy to, to do, generally. Uh, you just need to try yourself at it, uh, bring a bag of mixed batteries at your facility, put them on a bench and begin, begin to, to sort them. And uh, you will realize quite rapidly that there are many, many types. 
and that there are ways to identify them and uh, generate uh, distinct uh, loads of these. Uh, but before starting, we need maybe to ask ourselves, uh, go to the basic, what is a battery? How are they classified? Uh, they have many, many names. Sometimes uh, people will talk to you about this type of battery, which is the same as this type. Uh, you're no, if you don't know uh, all the nicknames, then you, you can get lost eventually. So we'll go through this and uh, we'll be able at the end to recognize their types. And that's the first step. Some definition. Uh, a battery, uh, honestly, it's like a small chemical plant <laughs> and miniature. So it, it's a source of electrical energy generated by direct conversion of chemical energy into and uh, is either one or more primary batteries or secondary secondary batteries. Um, a primary battery cell, uh, they are not rechargeable because mainly there is a kind of chemical reaction occurring inside the batteries uh, that will deplete some elements and at the end uh, you can use it only one time. Compared to the second secondary batteries, where they are rechargeable, meaning that uh, it's possible to uh, reinitiate the uh, chemical reaction inside the, uh, the element, the unit, by uh, recharging them mainly. They are, <laughs> that's not a surprise to anybody. There is many shape, many formats, many brands. Uh, in general, they are characterized by their voltage, we can see here yeah, there is a 9 volt. There is also some code. We will go to this. Uh, it's also written. It's quite clear. This one is alkaline batteries. Uh, you will see also plus, plus signs in general. Plus and minus sign indicating that there is a position to use them. And sometimes it's maybe less clear like this one on the, on the right, where you have uh, a capacity written in milli ampere per hour. So this is coming from a battery pack. And this one is not a battery. These, in fact. Uh, why I'm showing this to you, <laughs> what is not a battery? It's because um, it's happening uh, quite often in some uh, uh, recycling facilities. Uh, we deal with uh, there is some mix up of capacitors with batteries and these uh, arrive at uh, uh, sorting battery sites and they have to get rid of them. So those are capacitors, mainly they are storing some uh, some uh, energy uh, to be used in the washing machine in general, microwave. Uh, there is two types of capacitor, the starting capacitors and you get what the one we call running capacitors that are more like uh, they have a seal uh, containment, you know, it's because they have some uh, wet, uh, eventually wet uh, paper inside that may contain some little presence of oil mainly. So these, um, there are not batteries, they can be sell, they can be sent in general for incineration at high temperature to get rid of them. This is one that I think you can do. Uh, or the the starting capacitor, you can send them to uh, uh, metal recyclers because, in fact, they are not containing. Uh, they are not so risky compared to the other one that they may eventually have some PCBs, especially the old old one. Uh, the most recent one normally should not have any PCB inside them since 1979. So it depends um, of the of their age mainly. And also here we got like other type of electrolytic capacitor, many, many shape, many types. So these ones, it's, it's maybe more obvious that they were not batteries, but just to mention that we can send this one also to, to metal smelter. There is no risk in the metal smelter to get rid of them. Uh, the system are equipped uh, with filtering system in the chimney to manage the eventual presence of the little components inside the uh, capacitors that are consider nothing. Uh, another type of identification of batteries, we talk sometimes of dry and wet batteries. 
Uh, dry batteries, it's quite easy. It's the common one we use at home, uh, like uh, the alkaline ones. Uh, mainly, they have like a solid base inside where there is a, uh, an electrolyte compared to the wet batteries. Very easy, you know, the, the one of your car where you will have some uh, presence of acid, sulfuric acid inside it uh, to make uh, the joint between the, uh, the electrodes. But we have to see that all batteries contain a corrosive liquid or semi-liquid electrolyte that is either a strong acid or a strong base. Uh, in Europe, we split the waste battery in accumulators in two, uh, two types. In general, it's industrial and automotive batteries and accumulators and portable batteries and accumulators. Uh, for the battery portable, we have the primary, which are single use, secondary that are rechargeable. We already talked about it. Uh, there is not too much difference between the, the processing of the primary and the secondary in general, because uh, they will go through a shredder. But generally, there is uh, some step after that could happen uh, where you will have uh, the capacity to separate uh, some components, some elements from it. But I will often see this at the end uh, and at many times during the presentation, each chemistry implies a specific process and we will review that uh, during the presentation. Automotive batteries, uh, mainly they are the one that are used to, to start the motor of your car or any kind of vehicle, power lighting in general. Uh, and uh, yeah, and the uh, battery providing the power to drive electric vehicle are industrial and they are not automotive. Yeah. Uh, some fact about car batteries, very interesting. They are uh, a type of battery that you can recycle a lot of it, a lot of material about it. Uh, it contains in general eight kilograms of lead and four liter of sulfuric acid that is a bit contaminated. Uh, but all can be recycled. Uh, so in general, more than 90% of a, a battery, uh, a car battery can be recycled. But we, we have to, to find, uh, in this case, we have to pay attention uh, at the end processor that will manage them. We, it's important to make sure that the people handling them eventually uh, would do it on the proper manner to avoid any contamination of the land and that they will also protect their employees from uh, lead exp exposures. Uh, and there are also another type of uh, lead-based batteries that we call non-automotive. Uh, in general, these one, you will see them uh, on the uh, UPS, alarm system, emergency lightning. So they are kind of backup, backup system for lightning uh, or to provide power. Uh, but they have the same disposal rule as car batteries. Uh, some example of industrial, industrial batteries. Uh, uh, there are some pictures over there. Uh, so like I said, the uh, UPS system, uh, wheelchair, <laughs> wheelchair batteries as well. Uh, they, they, can, they, are, they can be used as a source of power for propulsion, mainly. Also, we have the, the batteries from the boot. Uh, so from time to time, you will see EV electric electric vehicle means uh, electric car or electric uh, pro propulsed vehicle. Uh, this include like wheelchairs, bicycle, airport vehicles. Um, well, uh, portable battery and accumulators. The portable again, it's uh, yeah. It, it seems we always talking about the same thing, but you know, it's always a different denomination. So portable is the, are the small ones that we can carry with us. Uh, they are seal in general, very small, under four kilograms. They're not a car battery. Uh, they're not designed for industrial or professional use. Um, they, they are used in many types of equipment from, um, you know, uh, music player, DVD controllers, uh, etc. and tools in general, so they are everywhere. And we have also battery packs, which are a system where you get uh, some cells linked together by contacts. Uh, they look huge and big, but in fact they are like single units linked together. So 
like uh, the big one here, uh, alkyne, uh, then you, the operator uh, needs to have a shredder able to, to shred. Generally, it's not complicated to shred because it's not like big thick metals, but uh, it has to, to go to that process eventually. Uh, a portable battery, a battery pack as well. You need, you have here the nickel canyon one for the end tools. Uh, you will recognize them because normally there is a, a C, cat, C design on it, meaning cadmium, and uh, don't throw the garbage to avoid the uh, diffusion of uh, pollution in the, uh, in the landfill. Very important to avoid this. Cadmium is a very, uh, it's a heavy metal, toxic. Uh, single use batteries um, again it's uh, th these are the ones that we found everywhere um, we one special thing about them is uh, they are not rechargeable so compared to the rechargeable one if you try to recharge them eventually you, you may have a, a fire or some in a way or they may explode so it's a, it's, a, it's kind of risky uh, one things to know as well is prior to 1996 uh, single use batteries some of them were containing mercury, so now this is something that is, should not happen anymore. Uh, thank, hopefully, uh, it's not possible to find them anymore uh, and the battery collected that you will receive eventually. Uh, there are some exceptions. There are some, I will show it to you later. There is a type of button cell battery where it's possible uh, to eventually find some type of mercury. It's kind of uh, easy to recognize by its shape. And the rechargeable batteries, again, use everywhere, uh, and tools uh, on your computer, uh, uh, digital camera, laptops, uh, they are, this is one of the, the big issue presently in the world of recycling because <laughs> they are everywhere and uh, they are not, so, always easy to recognize and uh, and the electronic waste recycling business it's creating a kind of a turmoil because uh, this means risk of fire eventually so uh, if they are not detected uh, they go through a tr shredding process and they end up with uh, uh, steel plastic or other fraction that is um, contains some pieces of those batteries and you, it can react and you can have a fire. Uh, so that's so that's a, that's an issue presently. Uh, there is also the nickel metal hydride and nickel cadmium batteries that are found in our common type of uh, high tech stuff that we use in our house. Yes. Voilà. So to to summarize, uh, primary batteries alkaline, saline, and lithium metal, and the uh, Secondary, which are the accumulator, are the lead acid, nickel cadmium, nickel metal hydrure, and lithium, lithium ion. Chemistries, chemistries and identification tips. In uh, our starting center in Europe, uh, the cells in general are separated in eight distinct uh, flows of batteries. Uh, this is done manually or semi-automatically with some kind of uh, tricks uh, with based on the physical uh, aspect of the batteries and sometimes it's fully automatic with some very fancy machine uh, equipped with computers um, but mostly we have one big load of alkaline salt zinc air batteries that represent uh, near 80 percent of the load and after that you have the lithium ones the mercury batteries uh, nickel cadmium accumulator, nickel metal hydrure, lithium ion, lead acid batteries, and we have a, a fraction of what we call contamination. Uh, in Europe, we collect a lot of batteries from um, collection point that could be uh, stores, um, could be like a, a box on the border of the street, and it ends up that people are throwing a lot of stuff inside these boxes, so you can find an uh, old telephone, uh, you can find Coca-Cola cans <laughs> or, or everything. So, but we, we need to sort these. Uh, in general, uh, there is a lot of contamination, uh, sadly. So, so people have to take care because sometimes also it could be contaminated by uh, 
uh, as an example, we found the sy syringes, you know, uh, some drug addicts, they just drop their syringe inside these kind of collection box. And so it's dangerous for the employees. So they need to, to, to pay attention to that. Uh, there is, I know, I know some uh, waste battery uh, sorter that uh, have more than eight categories. It depends, again, it will depend on their um, downstream vendors. If they, uh, they have some market, to separate some specific types of battery. As an example, in the lithium ion type, there is so many types, uh, it's possible uh, for them to identify a, a processor just for a specific one, then they will do it, they will remove it, and maybe they can make some money of it. Uh, man, now, <clears throat> uh, we, we all know that uh, batteries are identified some, with some kind of characteristics. Sometimes it's a, a code, it's a code, you know, like by letter, like A, 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 or um, C, D. This is based on the, the shape of the batteries, but it's also based on its composition. So um, the uh, American National Standard Institute uh, has developed a, a codification system to identify those batteries, with those code, uh, which are, uh, you can find information uh, on the web. And also there is the, uh, something that is more um, maybe widely used is the International Electrotechnical Commission code that describe the composition and the size of a battery. Uh, so these little letter on the batteries, they mean something in general. It's just not there for fun. As an example, the LR44 small alkaline batteries that I use for my calculator. Um, it's made of, uh, of three elements. The first letter uh, is the chemical system. As an example here, L stands for alkaline battery. Uh, if there is no letter, it's going to be saline. And after, after that, M, S, F, P, H, K means other type of batteries. Okay. Uh, R means that it's, it's round. It's quite uh, useful to know that. And S is square, F is flat, and P is not round. And the number code, the code means like the dimension of uh, the batteries. In this case, it's 44, 44 millimeter. So, uh, uh, but it's not always about the dimension. Sometimes also it's related to an old coding system. And so we have to pay attention to that. I have put for you some uh, example coming from uh, the web you know on wikipedia there are there are some people who have made some very good article about this where you can uh, get more a lot a lot of information about batteries so if you get at your site some batteries that you don't know what it is uh, and i didn't explain, explain it today you can refer to this table they will give you all the information about them it's a, it's a it's a very good source of information so you can see over there, uh, as you know, like the small round batteries, uh, CR2032 that we use sometimes for um, uh, like uh, the beeper for your fans, this kind of stuff, uh, your gate control, and it means it's C is for lithium mainly. And you got like the composition, uh, chemical composition of it, the voltage. So that's, a, that's good also when you have, sometimes you have on the battery, the voltage, you can refer to this, then you get like many information to be able to identify uh, the batteries. The more information you have, the more elements you have to make sure that it's a it's a good the good type of battery you have in your hands. Also, uh, yeah, I have put other links for the battery size. Each code that we have over there it's related to specific dimension. So, like uh, the the D battery, it's it's code the number code. People will, will talk in the industry about the R20 batteries. Uh, when you sell it to a customer, we talk about them. Uh, we call them like a D battery. And these are the effective uh, dimension uh, of a battery. Um, I verified it with my uh, <laughs> at home. It, those that are very good. Um, you may ask yourself, why do we need that information? It could happen if if you want sometimes to make some kind of a semi automatic sorting machine uh, if you pass those battery over some metal rods 
and you adjust the uh, the distance between the rods, you can then filter the batteries by size eventually uh, to let, you know, they will fall down between the interstices based on the dimension that you have uh, selected. So there are some people in the industry, they have, uh, I have seen a site, it was very well done where uh, the batteries were fed in an hopper, it was going down an alley to a conveyor, the conveyor was feeding, uh, some uh, slides made of road uh, metal rods, and between the slides, the, the interstices uh, batteries were separated and sorted. And it was for those people. They said it was easier to sort battery in a way because they had batteries all of the same size falling in their ends, and then they just have to check for the the nature of it. Yeah. Also, the, uh, on the, the, the Wikipedia site that uh, I gave you the reference, there are some very good information because uh, some of them, they have very, very fancy name uh, designation. And if you look at this table, they will explain to you what is it exactly, the composition of it, because sometimes you can have like a series of cells uh, installed together by some contacts. So uh, it, it's valuable information. Uh, you can look at it eventually. Uh, the difference between alkaline and zinc carbon. Mainly, the first thing you need to know: both will be processing the same process eventually because they both contain zinc. The only difference between them mainly is the electrolyte inside. One is acidic, the other one is alkaline. So that's the, the difference. But process-wise, they are going in the same uh, shredder, and uh, they will 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 mix eventually the black mass of these two types of batteries together. Um, these imprimary are single use batteries for sure, uh, many shapes as well. Uh, it's possible it's, it, that it is indicated do not recharge, mainly for the lithium primary, it's the case, do not recharge them, don't try to do it. Um, I found a, a very interesting one that is called lithium thionyl chloride that has a life expectancy of 20 years. So for me, like it's a, I call it a miracle battery. Uh, so maybe it's interesting to verify if you get some of them to see if they are still working. Uh, we'll talk about reuse and um, repurposing later. Uh, you will understand what I mean here. Lithium secondary, there are again many, many types from uh, because they, they are, we found them in our phones, our tablets, computer. But there is two types that are kind of um, coming uh, the most often is the, the lithium ion group, the one with the hard shell, and the lithium ion polymer, the one with the soft, soft shell. Uh, you will see it looks like a plastic gray bag. Um, this one, they are, more, they are more fragile eventually, and they are kind of risky, I have to say. So if you open uh, uh, lithium ion uh, secondary uh, from your computer, this is what you will find. It's, it should not be a surprise. You see, this is like six cells uh, attached together uh, with a little print circuit board. And you have uh, a plastic cover. Um, there is a possibility that the plastic uh, may contain eventually um, some brominated fire retardant because if the system is generated in some heat, it's possible. So this is something to check. Plastic with bruminated fire retardant, uh, we have uh, we don't recycle them in Europe. We they are going for destruction uh, because of the Stockholm Convention. Uh, we try to avoid to reuse them. Uh, the difference between uh, lithium secondary uh, and polymer and lithium ion, uh, yeah. They are soft shell, uh, they, they are, the, the lithium polymer they are very light, very, uh, uh, the weight is not very heavy and they have many, many names. So some, if you talk about this with other uh, recyclers, they, they have many names, funny names for them, like lithium ion polymer, lipoly, lipoly, lipo, and the other one, they are called lithium ion, li ion, li long, li co, because of the cobalt presence inside the, uh, the equipment. Okay. Uh, but in a sense, they are the same type of uh, of batteries. There is just a difference in the construction of them. And there is the lithium iron phosphate one. 
Um, this one doesn't contain any cobalt. Uh, uh, it seems that he has less less value, you know, for eventually a, a, a reuse of it. Uh, people are not so much interested in it, but uh, they are the people who are um, they are using the solar grid application uh, a lot, a lot in the e-scooters because uh, I understand that they are very cheap to produce. Um, but they have a good potential for eventually to be reused. Uh, if, um, as an example, uh, if you take a look at the e-scooter, uh, they are installed on the machine for uh, its life. That is in general quite uh, small because people don't take care too much of e-scooter in town. You know, they have a very rough life, but it's possible that the frame will die before the batteries. So there, there is maybe an opportunity to, to check for those batteries and see if we can do something with those eventually. Non-identifiable oh non batteries. Uh, yeah, and sadly, this is happening often. Uh, it depends where the batteries were stored before. Some people are keeping a lot of batteries at home or in the garage for many years. Or it could be also e-waste recyclers that has forgot somewhere uh, a bag of batteries in the corner and then it got rust. And then the, the guy in charge of sorting received this and he asked himself, well, what will I do with this? <laughs> there is no information on it. So uh, in general, the, what I've been told by battery recyclers, uh, they don't lose so much time about it. They will send them to alkaline. They will take the risk especially the cylinder one. Um, but there are some some tips. There are some possibilities to to guess what they are really. This is what we will look at on the, on the next slide. So what has been told by uh, battery sorters is that uh, the heads of the batteries are not typically the same. So as you can see, the alkaline head is uh, like a full metal head while the lithium primary head has a little, uh, a little, uh, how do you say in English, uh, uh, scratch on it. And the uh, nickel metal uh, you can see a metal head and there is a kind of plastic round uh, circle around it. So th there is a possibility to identify them by their head and also by their some, some size uh, of the batteries. It's a question to take the time to do it mainly. So let's try. That's an example. Uh, as you can see, uh, there is, I'm guessing some of them here could be like nickel metal hydro, and uh, there is maybe one of them that is some of them that are alkaline. So it's it's based on their physical characteristic. But hopefully, uh, uh, if they are well managed at the origin, we will not face this type of situation. But it's happening. I've seen bags of alkaline batteries, big bags of alkaline batteries sitting outside for a couple of weeks and they got rusty. It was not nice. Special case, uh, sorting button cell batteries. Uh, these in general, they are very well identified. There is always a little code on it. Uh, but here there is a table explaining uh, the typical voltage of them uh, and also when they have uh, typical labels, which which type it is mainly. So you see when S, it is SR, it's a silver oxide. And this one here is the one I told you that may contain mercury that has a special shape, you know. So this is the MRB625. So when it's MR, mercury, zinc air for PR, SR, silver oxide and alkaline. Alkaline, it's LR or AG. Well, and for the, the lithium bottom cell, uh, in general, uh, there is, a, we can see two types, the, the manganese dioxide one, with, which has like a three volt uh, uh, voltage and the carbon monofluoride lithium that has a 2.8 volt. Uh, so, but uh, yeah, lithium, uh, 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 when it's lithium, you will not treat them with the, the other one that are alkaline or are, uh, argentic. So. 
Uh, why sorting is good for the planet? Well, so we saw that some batteries have a potentially toxic metals. We talk about cadmium, there is the lead, there is uh, also some mercury from the uh, historic loads that uh, appear at the moment on the market. Uh, for sure, if we can uh, divert those uh, toxic metals from the nature and keep them in, uh, in a safe uh, environment like a landfill, landfill, or to recycle them like it's possible to recycle cadmium, it's important to do it. You know, uh, we want to make sure that there is no. Um, also, you need to make sure if they are going to a landfill, uh, because sometimes you have no choice. Uh, at least it should be like a landfill with um, all the necessary protection to avoid the uh, contamination of the uh, water source uh, on the ground. Mainly. So it should be like a, a controlled landfill with uh, HPD layers, uh, station of controls, etc. Uh, so a good level of clay inside them. Um, so we have that in Europe. Uh, those kind of uh, landfill. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I, I'm not sure about other countries uh, outside of Europe. Uh, apologize for that. But uh, yeah, yeah, you have to pay attention to make sure that it's not going in the nature, those type of battery. Uh, we know as well that it's good for uh, most of battery can be recycled uh, with very high recycling efficiency. Uh, we have evidence from our recyclers in Europe that they can do very good things uh, with the batteries and it can even go uh, further than what the law requires mainly. Uh, recycling minimizes the need to mine virgin uh, resources and create uh, devastation of nature, so it protects the habitat and also it's reducing the carbon footprint of manufacturing process. Okay, now I know how to identify the, uh, the type of battery. Uh, uh, if you receive some loads of battery uh, per period of time, what could I do? What can I do? Uh, for sure, if you receive uh, 10 tons of lead acid batteries, it's easy to manage because it's quite fast. It's it's ba car batteries, you know. Um, but if you have uh, 10 tons of mixed portable batteries, it's maybe it's going to be more work. Uh, what happens if you have 10 tons, 100 tons? or 1,000 tons a year of batteries. Uh, I've made some calculation for you here, just to show, uh, to reduce this to an hour, an hour uh, uh, yeah. Um, I think I've made an error here, anyway. Uh, so as an example, if you have 833 kilograms per month, uh, you can, if you have 20 days, then you will, uh, and the, so it means that, um, uh, and that, uh, in those days, you will be able to process 40, 42 kilograms, which means five kilograms per hour. Okay. Uh, if you have 8,300 kilograms per month, then it's going to be 400 kilograms per day or 52 kilograms per hour. And that's it. Uh, and if you have like uh, 83 tons of per month of batteries, uh, then it means that you need one. Of, you can do eventually 500 kilograms per hour, which uh, that's maybe not easy per hour. It's going to be probably like per uh, per shift per eight hours, because no, I, I didn't make error. The, the, the numbers are okay. Uh, I had a doubt for a moment. Uh, but, you know, I, I discussed with uh, a recycler uh, in Spain uh, what that, that has a very basic system for sorting batteries. Um, you know, like um, a little upper, a little conveyor, uh, people that will sort the batteries uh, manually with a good lighting system. Uh, they, they can do 0.5 to 2 tons per shift per man. Uh, so, it seems to be like a big difference, 0.5 to 2 tons uh, per shift, but it depends on what you receive. Sometimes the batteries uh, arrive from the collection point with uh, they are in packaging, so they have to unpack. Sometimes they are on bags, they have to cut the bags, clean, uh, remove all the uh, contamination. So, yeah, and sometimes 
if it's only alkaline they receive it and it's quite fast because that's the goal mainly remove uh, let, let pass the alkaline at the end of the bucket of the conveyor because this is like the mass uh, the easy mass to remove and uh, after that you have to separate the other ones mainly uh, what technology makes sense when um, i would say that for uh, 10 ton, one to one to 100 ton per year, maybe more. Uh, a simple table is sufficient, and people around to to sort them. Uh, you need to have some buckets around you, well identified, and people can throw them inside. Some batteries maybe don't throw them too hard, like lead acid batteries and lithium batteries. Maybe you can just depose them <laughs> inside the drums, uh, but we will explain for the storage later. Uh, it will depend also about your investment, what type of batteries you will receive, what is the volume. So, yeah, this is things to think. Um, what do I need to start uh, to sort batteries? This is what I said, yeah. Uh, the lead acid, it's easy to solve, but you have to pay attention. You may have some fence batteries. Fence batteries, they are like alkaline one, uh, alkaline batteries, but they look like they have the size of um, a car batteries with a kind of plastic shelf, so you have to separate them. Um, but if it's for a small mixed portable batteries, uh, most of them would be alkaline. So the, the challenge is really to spot the one that are not alkaline. Uh, you need a table, box, drums identified with the chemistry, the chemistry you want to sort. Uh, you can drop them, you can throw them in the boxes, except for lithium ion and lead to avoid breakage. When I say you can throw them, also pay attention to not throw them in the face of your, your colleague, you know. Uh, so, yeah, there is some kind of distance, safe distance to respect. Uh, and you have to, to, to watch out because sometimes you may have some small lead acid batteries from UPS alarm system mixed with your batteries. Anyway, this is the case in Europe. Uh, it will depend in your case of what is the source of your batteries. Uh, you will need staff, people to sort the batteries. So to be a good sorter, uh, the people you will, you will employ, they need to have first good sight. They will be able to distinguish color, shape, and small details. Uh, they have to be quick, quick-minded, you know. Uh, I can tell you I've seen people working, it's amazing. Uh, at, at the moment when you get a training, people working on a conveyor, Everything is passing so fast, <laughs> but they can do it. They are so used to, to the type, the, the brand of batteries. They know this one is, is um, lithium primary. This one is NEMH, uh, NECD. Uh, they're, they're good at it. Reading knowledge is primordial, I would say. Uh, if you cannot read, it, it's going to be complicated. A good memory as well about the details, meticulous, quality driven, and also good judgment because we rely on them to make sure that they don't put the bad batteries with the other ones, like an, as an example, a lithium battery that would create a problem in the load of a specific batteries uh, that is destined to a, a customer for, for processing eventually. So, yeah. Uh, so the, the battery, uh, I repeat again, they are sort uh, specifically according to the destination of the end process okay so the for the downstream vendors but in general downstream vendors if you sell your batteries to somebody else like in europe they will also perform a quality control on what they receive because they don't want to contaminate uh, the fraction coming out from their process okay um, Debris contamination should be also managed with in a very safe and uh, environmentally friendly uh, way. Um, so to find destination for the plastic, the paper, the aluminum can, and also proper destination for what could be dangerous as a, like syringe. Uh, so you may need eventually some kind of special glove. It depends of what you receive. You will see if you need to pay attention at that. But, uh, yeah, it's it's a big risk. Uh, pertinent identification of drum is needed. Establish procedure. Train your employees about the, the sorting process. Uh, also, one of the best practice I have seen people are creating posters that they will put around the sorting area. 
uh, with the pictures of the most common one they receive in, in the sector, because you may have some local brands uh, in your area that uh, we will not see here in Europe. So you establish your posters, any MH, these are the ones we receive. And uh, it's also helping to share information and knowledge with other operators eventually. Here we have an example of a site in Europe where uh, they have a conveyor and there is a, a person that will pick what is not uh, alkaline mainly. What is not alkaline, she will take them and they will she will put them inside the box. This is feeding uh, some drums that are located under. So yeah, for larger quantity, you may need a, a hopper that you will feed that will uh, that will feed a conveyor. Ideally, if you have a, a button for non uh, to stop and start the conveyor, it's good for the employee because at the moment you may have a surge of batteries and you may, have, you may need time to make a proper sorting. Uh, and after that, you can just push the button to, to make them move. That's the good way to go. Uh, and so at the extremity, you may have like a, a box or a big bag that will receive all the alkaline batteries. Normally. So the, mainly the job of the operator is to remove what is not a caddy. Um, and uh, for sure, some of them, some, some of those batteries, they have a positive value. So it's interesting to make sure that they are properly sorted. Um, we know that by experience of my colleagues working in Landbell Group that lead acid batteries, nickel, metal, and lithium ion with cobalt, they have a positive value. All the other type of batteries, then you have to pay for treatment. So mainly. Another good thing to do if you develop this kind of activity is to keep data information. So uh, it's good to make a, a, a kind of mass balance of what you have received and verify what is the content of the load that you have sorted. This information can help you for the future to establish your budget and try to see what is your revenue, what is your cost. So I strongly recommend this. This is data coming from a study made in, in Europe in 2017. There, there are many studies done every year by many people. So uh, you can also compare uh, with other region area. Uh, it's interesting to, to get this information. It will help you for sure. Some uh, sorting ideas for, for the engineer sleeping in you if eventually you want to develop something that make you uh, more performant. So this is what I talked uh, previously about mechanical sorting based on uh, the battery physical property. So uh, if you install this kind of um, grid system, you can then catch the button cell batteries. And if you make uh, the the um, interstices larger than you can eventually get like thinner batteries or a specific type of battery. So it's interesting. It could help you to gain some time on the sorting process. <clears throat> and this is the automatic sorting uh, process. Uh, some people in Europe have invested in this kind of technology where uh, What's happening? It's uh, you feed a hopper, the hopper will feed a, a kind of track, and the track will push the batteries at high speed um, uh, under a camera where you have a computer. The computer will compare the uh, image of the passing batteries with uh, the computer database to verify, uh, to make a kind of association with the type of batteries. And when he has detect, that that is it, it is like let's say it's uh, nickel cadmium batteries and it correspond to the box here the third box then when it will arrive at that box so on the rail uh, there will be a kind of uh, air uh, air jet that will happen uh, a valve will open some air compressor will push the battery in that box so this can go quite fast it can process like uh, half a ton per hour uh, but it has a cost. Uh, it's more than 200,000 euro uh, equipment investment. But we have many recyclers working on this and it's quite uh, effective, uh, telling us that um, my understanding is that the alkaline, the alkaline battery, the purity could be around 98%. Uh, so it's, uh, it's interesting. 
this is an 98 percent i was told this like five six years ago and maybe now it's better they have surely improved the process since that time there is a if you're interested i have left eventually a little video maybe we don't have time for the moment to look at it but it's quite impressive um, a video made by this enterprise that create this machine so i recommend it so uh, a, a kind of small resume we have gone through uh, many ways to identify the batteries we know why knowledge of chemistry is so important uh, there is many re things that we we need to check when we um, when we know about the chemistry, the storage condition, the handling condition, the processing condition that will happen eventually. Uh, the type of battery should tell us also that uh, there is some risk associated to it. So we need to think in advance of management situation, emergency management situation. So uh, yeah, and also if you if there is some risk associated battery and we do nothing, then there are some potential liabilities. Uh, the ability is related to the fact that uh, you contaminate the soil, you have uh, poisoned your employees, or you have put uh, the fire on the town, you know. Uh, so yeah, that's why it's important to know about the batteries. Uh, and again, I say it, it's important. Each type of battery has its own specific process. Uh, we will go through uh, in the next slide uh, eventually about lithium, lead acid batteries and portable. We'll talk about the, the process to be applied. Um, so about sorting, identification, uh, what is important to look at here is the chemistry present and the risk associated, uh, for sure, separated into different type. Why? To avoid risk, to increase your value, and that's also based on the market opportunities, the links that you have with uh, recyclers and your area, or uh, there is probably in your country people involved in metal recycling, uh, foundries, uh, there is probably things to do with them. Uh, what do I need to be aware uh, of? When? Why do I need to be aware of when I do this? When you, you want to start to sort batteries and sell them, um, you need to build your knowledge about the chemistry uh, of the batteries uh, and share with your employees the identification tips. Uh, you need to put in place good storage practice, uh, batteries need to be kept uh, uh, in waterproof area over um, a floor that will not lead to contamination of the ground. Um, also, uh, to make sure that there is uh, uh, what is necessary to avoid fire, to combat fire. You know, also train your people on firefighting. It's important. Uh, anyway, with lithium battery, the history for the moment is that every uh, I would say that every week there is a fire somewhere, maybe every day. I've read something recently. I don't ex I don't remember exactly what was the frequency, but it's an issue now in Europe about the, the lithium batteries uh, fires, and also uh, health and safety practice for handling to avoid contamination of the people. We'll talk about it as well. Before maybe launching yourself in the uh, sorting uh, process. Maybe invest in that uh, business. Maybe you need to ask yourself some question. Uh, what is it important to be aware in the market before launching yourself in this type of activity? Uh, is there any local authorized processes for treatment already? Is there a way like a downstream vendor, somebody that can receive the material that you will sort? Uh, or is there any opportunities for second hand material recovery, foundries? Uh, metal recyclers, uh, or maybe also transformation of the black mass and something else. Is there presence of competitors? Evidently, if you are 10 guys in the same town, it's going to be complicated. Uh, you need also to look at the laws and regulation of your country regarding this activity. What can be done? Is there any presence of a um, compliance scheme in your area that could uh, maybe help you or which we which uh, which you could have a contract to develop your activity uh, is there any grant opportunities in your country or with ong regarding the development of something that could lead to a, a valuable process uh, that could help uh, also the entire country uh, and also the collection methods how you will collect your battery uh, because the batteries, uh, we need to ask ourselves from where they will come eventually. They, they may arrive mixed, 
uh, and you maybe you will ask yourself, should I collect battery myself? This will depend also of the market and the opportunity and risk. Uh, if you have a trucks, this is something you're interested in. You have a knowledge of people that could help you reorganizing this. Yeah, it's up to you. Uh, but uh, like in Europe, we have very good network for uh, collection and uh, and also the laws makes it quite, uh, it's, yeah, it's part of the law. You need to have a collection system in it. So so people, they are sure that they will receive batteries. Uh, what should I do from a business point of view? Uh, you should, you could estimate the volume eventually that you can receive, establish what you can yourself do. Uh, do we have enough physical space for that in infrastructure? Um, you can get also uh, contacts with other recyclers to see will I get money from this type of battery or will I pay, have to pay? Will I will I have to pay for treatment? Uh, so this will help you uh, establish operating costs, your potential turnover, and also you need to talk with the environmental authorities to have an idea of the the permits. Uh, for the forcing activity. So yeah, there is many things to, to think about when you are launching this type of uh, activity. The most common battery will depend on what you're collecting. If you're collecting from office, it's going to be probably computer batteries, rechargeable. From store, alkaline mix. From garage, lead acid batteries, car batteries, yeah, for sure. Or uh, from an e-waste recyclers, you may have an e-waste recycler in the area that is removing batteries, doesn't know what to do with it. You, they will come mix, maybe with capacitors. Um, the volumes, we, we saw that if you have small volumes, medium volumes, you can have a little, you can train your team. Uh, if you have very, very large volume, again, if it depends on the manpower that you have, if you have a lot of people working for you and uh, it's possible to split the work with many people, maybe you, jo you don't need uh, high investment for the, the sorting process. Uh, yeah, you just need the room and the people. Uh, where I am going to have profit or losses, the profit will come from the metal and the, the CRM, the critical raw material like cobalt, nickel, um, the lead, and the losses will come from the hazardous waste management uh, that you have to, some ways that you will need to destroy uh, you need to find specialized enterprise for that, for sure. Uh, yeah, that, that's an issue. Uh, and what is most hazardous and how can you contribute to reduce pollution? That's why we're all, that's why GIZ is organizing this kind of session and training. We want to reduce the pollution of the nature. So your help is needed to recover lead and sulfuric acid and lead acid batteries, cadmium and nickel cadmium and mercury if present in the alkaline batteries. For the moment, they are like, uh, some some issues that we want to to uh, to handle, you know, with uh, with your help. Wow, question on sorting and identification. Daniel, do you have any questions from uh, your side? Because me, I don't see if people have questions. Thank you so much, Mario, and thank Sorry. you so much as well for for the last. Uh, what was it almost an hour presenting on, on all of the different battery types and sorting is really very useful information. Um, so I would have one uh, first question from my side. I mean, I've heard from recyclers in African context, sometimes there will be batteries coming in without any labeling at all uh, from, let's say, cheap Chinese uh, applications. Um, do you have any experience with this? What, what could they look out for? Can you apply the same sorting rules to these kind of batteries which don't really give you any information? Okay, uh, bon. first, it's the first time I hear about batteries without any identification. The other one I know is the the, <laughs> the one that are rusty. <laughs> uh, but now you talk to me about new batteries uh, in good shape, good state that have no identification. Um, wow. So do we talk about like huge volume or just like a, a handful or Okay, well, maybe maybe it's too far back in my in my memories to to be a relevant question then. But I think possibly it's it's possible to then look at the the if, if the, the situation does occur, probably mm -hmm. they can look at the the end caps right to to figure out what could could work. Yeah. Uh, I would say that if you had um, 
you know, the, the very nice and fancy uh, automatic sorting system I shown, you know, from uh, refined. They have some magnetic resonance. It's it's almost like uh, uh, they, they get like a, a view of the inside of the batteries, giving them an idea of the um, chemical present inside the batteries. Uh, an automatic system sorting system will handle it quite easily uh, due to magnetic resonance. I think they, they, they will be able to sort them uh, manually. Um, there is probably by looking uh, at the cover of the batteries, that's maybe some hints we can get from there. You know, if it's an alkaline, we saw that there is a kind of metal cover. Uh, lithium, you may have a little, uh, little dent on the cover. I don't know, you see the, the, the presentation presently, you see the lithium there? There is a little dent over there. And you see the alkaline. Do you see my arrow, Daniel? Uh, yeah. Go again. Yeah, you see alkaline. You see alkaline. There is a metal cover. The lithium here. There is a little dent. That could be like an indication that this is like a lithium uh, uh, primary. Um, and we saw that uh, nickel metal hydro. They had like a kind of metal uh, cap with a little kind of dark plastic um, uh, circle around. You know, um, that's probably. One of the things I would take a look at first, uh, try to identify some kind of physical uh, <laughs> indice of what it is exactly. But uh, yeah. Okay, great. But I, I would be interested to to get a, a handful of it to try to make some tests. Maybe we, there is something we can uh, we can do. But, uh, or maybe if there's any recyclers in in listening and they can confirm. Um, what I said is is actually happening or not uh, in the chat? That would be useful. Maybe I was uh, being told a uh, uh, a fable, but it seemed like something that could happen to me. Um, Heva, you have a question. I've unmuted you, so you can go ahead and, and ask if you can unmute your microphone. doesn't seem to be working. So the question is, do you know the differences between developing and development countries regarding the quantities and types of batteries they're likely to see? Hello? Ah, Heba, yes, go ahead. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I'd like to, uh, thanks for the presentation at all. Uh, I'd like to ask a question about the, the difference between the quantity and types of batteries which used in the development and developing countries. Um, are there any differences in the usage or, or others? Uh, sadly, I would not be able to answer this because, you know, uh, I work mainly in Europe, so uh, I don't have a view on the statistic of Africa or Southeast Asia or um, but uh, I'm sure there is on the web somewhere some kind of information about this. Yeah. yeah, I would invite our other participants to answer that question in the chat if you have an idea what the big differences would be. I think there's more likely to be more uninterruptible power supplies or lead acid batteries, for instance, from power generation to these kind of aspects. But um, maybe there's some other participants who have a good idea to answer that question for you, Heba. For sure, the, the countries that they have some kind of uh, EPR, they have uh, idea of the put on the market. So we from there, you can start from there. You will see what is common, most commonly used. That's why it's important for the operator to, to use the data of his country uh, to make a good judgment on what he can do, what, what he can have eventually as revenue. It will depend on what is really used in his country. So we had a, another question from Sonia saying um, to what extent the legal constraints are also relevant. I think you already went into this a little bit. Uh, if you want to add anything to this, Mario. So the question is? Uh, to what extent are the legal constraints something that we have to pay attention to? I think you, you probably already went over this more or less in, in your last slides. So maybe we don't need to do more on this and just uh, offering the chance to, to maybe explain a bit more. I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. 
<laughs> what is the question? Are the legal constraints also relevant? I mean, the answer is yes. <laughs> uh, so I think uh, probably we don't need to go into that question then uh, to, to any, any more detail. Another question from Seren Yao. Do you charge or pay for the recycling of the nickel cadmium and nickel metal hydride batteries? What solutions do you have for the Cosmos batteries? Yeah, in Europe, in general, nickel cadmium battery, there is a cost associated to the treatment of it uh, because um, cadmium, uh, the, you require a very tight and sealed system to recover these heavy metals. So a lot of uh, security measure. So at the end, the, uh, the recyclers of this type of uh, product, or this type of batteries, which are not so uh, uh, many, uh, they have a kind of, um, it's a small group of people. So yeah, you have to pay for it mainly to, to it's related to the security aspect of the uh, cadmium uh, recovery. Because you know, cadmium is an STV metal, you can find it, uh, it's, a, it's already an issue in the waste recycling facilities that uh, are performing um, uh, shredding of uh, electronic waste. There is some cadmium that is also released in the, the atmosphere and the dust. It's we have to monitor it uh, in some facilities when it's not properly sealed. Um, so yeah, we have to pay for nickel cadmium and nickel metal. There is less uh, issue. So there is a my colleague in charge of the contracts with the operators. Uh, they are getting money from nickel metal. Uh, I don't know the the what we get as a money. As a price, it's not my. Um, this is managed by my colleagues inside the company. My job is more like uh, compliance and try to make sure uh, people respect the regulation and uh, do a good job. And don't uh, get their employees sick and uh, don't uh, pollute the environment. So my, my job is more compliance than uh, contracts. So I'm sorry that I cannot give you hints about the pricing, but um, but I'm sure if you contact uh, at the end of the uh, presentation, I have put uh, a table with uh, countries and name of recyclers and their website. So I'm sure if you contact some people over there, some of them will be happy to discuss with you about uh, potential pricing. Yeah, thanks for that, Mario. So um, there's a few questions coming in now around exporting. I mean, there was one at the beginning. Should I export lithium batteries um, or lithium metal batteries with lithium iron or separate these? This has been a bit answered in the, in the chat that it makes more sense to separate these. Um, and then on technology and treatment of batteries, lithium iron batteries. So um, I think all these questions we're about to answer, right? In in the next section on lithium iron batteries and, and then going on to lead acid batteries. We, we um, talk about, yeah, the next session we talk about uh, the lithium and uh, the lead acid batteries uh, treatment. The last uh, section of the, the presentation we discuss about um, the, the transfer uh, aspect, the commentation. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think let's take the moment to, to have a five minute break. And we will restart uh, with the next section on lithium ion batteries and how we can manage these how we can um, address this this waste stream um, and then go into some more of those details. So we'll see you back here, I think, at 2.31 or so in five minutes uh, and yes. just give you a chance to go to the toilet, uh, grab a coffee, feed your dog, whatever you need to do. Yeah. And we'll be back it's in five minutes. The dogs. They, will, they will bark. <laughs> Great. So we'll be restarting in five minutes. Okay, thank you.
Okay, it's been five minutes and we have a lot of um, content to get through. So Mario, I don't know if you managed to feed your dogs, feed yourself, because the toilet was probably tight, right? Maybe you're not back yet. I'm there. Okay. Are you ready? I'm ready when you want. Okay, perfect. So I just had a little chat here with Bazura and she can confirm that there are batteries coming from China and other ones that are locally manufactured, which don't have any labels. She will look and see if she finds some pictures for us. So this is a problem that is occurring, but hopefully with the tips you gave, it's possible to, to manage those batteries as well. There is not a single uh, little number somewhere. Uh, tag. Let's see if we, we find some pictures and then, and then we can find out. Barcode, is it even a small barcode? It's kind of strange. <laughs> there are many strange things happening in the world, but I hope I hope we get some pictures and then we can we can figure out if it's possible to identify these at all or if, if they have it's a no, it's a no mark battery made by somebody who's not proud of his product or <laughs> I don't know. Normally, when you you market something, you want to to say hey, it's from me. It's, I made it. So well, it's strange. But at least uh, we can confirm that it was not just something that I made up, uh, which is which is good. Um, so yeah, Ma Mario, uh, let you carry on with the program as we don't have too much time, and um, I hand the floor back over to you. Yeah. Uh... Okay, now we'll talk about uh, lithium iron batteries. Uh, we saw that they came very many type of size and shapes. Uh, and often they are um, they are installed uh, in some kind of electronic products where it's not really designed to be dis disassembled. It's an issue for e-waste recyclers where you can find uh, small batteries glued inside some phones. And then it's uh, when it's time to uh, to remove it, <laughs> then it's it's a it's a healthy healthy risk for the, the employees because it can eventually uh, get on fire, especially if it's a lithium polymer or if by with a screwdriver you go through it and you damage it, then you have a, an issue, a problem. So we will have uh, the situation with lithium ion batteries. We uh, we may have good cells and dead cells, good cells that could eventually be reused and repurposed. Uh, maybe we sh we could try to recover them and do some testing. This is something we'll discuss. And uh, the, the dead cells, the one that cannot be recycled, eventually, uh, no, we have no choice. They have to be recycled. I would say that, uh, in, in my view, the best thing to do is to uh, prepare them to to travel a bit, you know, when the correct packaging, and then you export them based on the the, the regulation to a specialized enterprise that will extract the most of it. Uh, otherwise, yes, maybe you can try to do something locally, but for me, uh, I, I, I think it's going to be more like more problems than solutions. I don't know. It's uh, if you, you wish to eventually shred uh, some kind of uh, lithium batteries, uh, some people on YouTube will probably um, incite you to do it. Uh, you, if you have the chance to look at the YouTube and just put like lithium shredding as a in your search, you will see a lot of people shredding <laughs> lithium batteries like this, and then they they, they will go through the, the shredder, and under you will have fraction that will uh, fume a little bit. Uh, you say, ah, oh, it's not too bad, but you know those those fraction may take a time to react eventually. If you shred a lot of these, you put them somewhere. At the moment, they, they may uh, they may get on fire and burn. You know, so it, it's a problem. Or if you want to do it, you want to have a shredder for lithium batteries. Um, then you need to have a, a downstream vendor eventually for the the black mass extracted from this. Uh, but to to manage it, that black mass that came from lithium shredding. Uh, I would recommend to to have it immersed in water for uh, a, a long period of time, but then you will have some issues that will come out eventually. The management of water that is contaminated, and also the handling of wet material that is not always easy. 
and uh, you you don't know if your downstream vendors wants to have something that is wet, uh, if he's equipped for that. Uh, there is many things to think about if you go that way for shredding of lithium battery by yourself and your facility. You try to develop something uh, brand new from yourself. Um, that it's risky, I would say. Uh, so my first my first reaction would be to to try to do it uh, uh, with people that have like special process for that, that have the knowledge because it's um, you may have some issues. Like the the, the lithium battery recyclers, uh, they have system in place that will allow them to separate uh, the elements of the batteries, the the cobalt and the lithium salt concentrate, uh, the stainless steel part, and after that, copper, aluminium, plastics. Uh, so they, they will make the most out of it, let's say. Um, Hydrometeorology in the EU, this is one of the presets that is used uh, that will allow the recovery of the cobalt and nickel and copper. Um, the process that I have seen myself, the, uh, the lithium batteries, they are process they are shredded uh, inside uh, a liquid phase so this is this is eliminating eventually the um, the risk of, of fire um, then the, you will have like all the black mass that will go out in a tank this black mass will be uh, processed with chemical reaction uh, for the treatment and the extraction of valuable metal like cobalt uh, through chemical reaction uh, you will get a sludge that will go, uh, that will recover, then pump in a, in a filter, and you will have a filter cake that will be that cobalt uh, powder. So it's a, it's possible to do it. It's a huge plant with major investment, uh, and it's 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 a good solution to recover the the value of it because, uh, yeah, this is the way to go. I would say. For sure, lithium batteries, uh, landfilling and dumping is not recommended. Because uh, eventually, and uh, if it's not a proper landfill, you, you may have like contamination of the soil. Uh, you will have some leaks from the equipment. You don't know how they will be managed inside that landfill. They can be compressed, crushed with other things. Uh, it will lead to contamination. And not talking about the eventual uh, fire that can uh, be generated uh, from uh, for poor management of these these batteries. Uh, Lithium ion storage aspect. Uh, if you sort uh, lithium uh, ion batteries, uh, there are many things that you, you need to pay attention to avoid to have like a risky situation. I have put an image over there. Uh, it's a, an image I took during an audit in Europe somewhere. Uh, those are the drums where we find uh, the lithium ion batteries. Uh, uh, as you can see, uh, the area is very crowded. There is pallets, there are uh, big bags, cardboard, there are uh, drums of uh, foam, uh, cardboard. Anyway, many things that could be eventually good fuel for a fire. And also, if you have to make like a, a emergency response in this type of situation, it's going to be complicated because um, uh, to access the area, not that easy. So I would say, um, don't keep inside your building drums containing damaged or lithium uh, ion uh, batteries, uh, but you you can keep them in an area which is protected from moisture and rain. Okay, or if you put it inside a building, uh, the building should be made of uh, material that will resist a fire eventually. Uh, ideally, they are stored in metallic drum with a niche DPE internal layer, a kind of bag with a certain thickness. Um, and like I said, away from combustible material to avoid uh, to have uh, fuel for the fire. Uh, I would say if you have damaged batteries and um, lithium ion batteries at the moment, uh, the more you keep in your building, uh, the more risky to represent. So you need to establish with your downstream vendors the quantity that you need for a shipment and don't try to not keep too much for nothing inside your building. 
they are better at your downstream vendors at inside your facility. Uh, another thing you need to know, uh, uh, I don't know if you ever open a drum containing uh, lithium uh, batteries. Uh, when you open it, normally there is a small odor coming out. It's like uh, the, uh, the, uh, the gas from your lighter, you know, when you smoke for your cigarette, your lighter. This is the, there is a kind of volatile uh, fume, fume coming out. So we, we try to avoid smoking, smoke in this area, uh, just to make sure, or to have some sparks, to make sure to uh, not generate an issue. Uh, when you have drums with those kind of batteries, uh, a good practice of the recyclers in Europe, it's to, um, if they make any movement of a drum or they fill a drum with batteries, uh, they will come at a regulator at a regular frequency with uh, an infrared uh, monitor uh, to verify the temperature of the drum, to verify if there is a nut spot. Because uh, moving around, moving the drums, you could create like a contact between some batteries, create an, there is an arc that is information, and then eventually it will generate an, uh, a fire, a fire of metal. Um, yeah. So there is a, this is like a, something implemented in many recyclers in Europe. And uh, even if they do this, they still have fires. But uh, it's, a, it's a good thing to do, I would say, to, to make sure to monitor if there is hotspot formation inside your drum. Uh, the storage of lithium batteries. Uh, what we recommend is, this is what is recommended, it's not me, but it's recommended to do it. It's metallic drum with the uh, HDPE bag. Uh, we talk about uh, a thickness of around 200 uh, micron. Uh, it's good to separate the batteries with uh, a dry media, uh, dry sand or vermiculite. Uh, that, that will help avoid contact and movement of battery inside the drum. Uh, I would say that dry sand is a uh, is losing speed, you know, on, on the business, because to manage dry sand is it's not that easy. Um, uh, first, you need to have a tank where you will store the sand, and you have to keep keep it free from moisture. So that that's not that easy, uh, especially in Europe where we have a lot of rain. Maybe in other countries it's easy. If you're in the middle of Sahara, uh, you will have dry sand enough, um, but most of the, the, the people now, they are going with vermiculite, which is a kind of, um, it's difficult to say in English. I don't know if it's vermiculite is English. Um, I'm sorry, because I'm French. Uh, um, it's like some kind of mico mineral material that we use sometimes to put in the, in the plants when you're gardening, you know, it will, it will get the, the soil very, um, uh, light, you know, it will help to the circulation of water in the plants. So this is what is vermiculite. Um, wh what I, I, I've seen is that uh, you see the drum on the left. Uh, Mo and friends presently the uh, compliance scheme involved with batteries. This is what they, they recommend for the um, the people collecting batteries. They they will put 10 centimeter of vermiculite, 10 centimeter of batteries. Try to layer them, layering them, layering it down inside the drum and uh, after that another 10 centimeter vermiculite and you know they make like a cake you say a millefeuille in French so uh, voila it's it's a way to limit contacts between batteries and also uh, the vermiculite will permit uh, on the road on the transfer ch shock control on the road so uh, they're not moving too much uh, Damage, oh yeah. If you if you use sand, uh, also the, one of the uh, bad thing about sand is it could be like 20% of the weight of the drum uh, compared to vermiculite that is very light. Uh, then, uh, yeah, you maybe you can put more batteries. I would say uh, damage batteries and plastic bags. There are some rules about this that you need to to check. Uh, this uh, could uh, to help limit contact and ideally. Uh, we, we need to avoid arc creation and tape the contacts to make sure that there is no contact between the batteries. It's it's a lot of work, I have to say, because you you, you want to protect the loads. Uh, for us, it's important when the, the drums are going on the road, um, 
that uh, we we protect the people on the road that will follow the truck as well or when they go inside the tunnel if they can go through a tunnel there is some rules about this um, this is something also to check yes uh, on the adr what can be used uh, as a road um, so yeah so um, uh, yeah this is the recommendation for the moment for the uh, the stock uh, the storage of uh, the batteries um, just a quick question, Mario. Yes. Uh, we have some in the chat. So Sarah is asking, we are currently using plastic drums to store lithium ion batteries. Do we need to change this? They are using uh, plastic drums? Yes. Uh, my, the idea is that uh, a metal drum uh, will support uh, probably a better any kind of, of blaze. The, the plastic drum will melt. Um, in general, uh, in Europe, the, uh, what we do at the level of collection for mixed batteries, we use plastic drums because you will have like uh, some lithium batteries mixed with uh, uh, alkaline, many, many alkalines. So the, it's less risky. OK, but at starting the moment you separate and sort the lithium batteries and you have them in a large quantity inside the same drum, uh, you better go with the, uh, the metallic drum and the HPDE bag, the bag and plastic. Let's see. OK, thanks. And then a question uh, the, on the safe period of time that you can keep it like this coming from Helen. I'm guessing that's asking uh, how long can you keep them like this uh, in, in such a, a storage container? Do you need to move them after a certain time? Uh, how much time you can keep? Uh, you know, if you can keep them. Uh, uh, away from moisture and uh, off shocks and um, perturbation, you know, that could uh, affect uh, the content of it. For myself, I would say there, there is no like limit, but uh, like I would say there is probably uh, in the regulation of your country somewhere a rule that would say that uh, when you have waste on site, it has to be, it has to stay there not much than uh, six months, one year, I don't know. It it depends probably of your local regulation, uh, I would say. But uh, my, to be honest, if my intuition tell me that you should manage to not keep them too much time eventually to avoid problems. You, uh, I, I need to, if, if you can have a load that will uh, justify the a shipment, if you can keep them from problems, uh, maybe you can keep them a long time, but you need to verify, to verify about the regulation in your country, how much time you can keep waste on site. It's, uh, and your permit, it should be written as well, I guess, if you have a permit for the operation. Yeah. Thanks for this. And then one last question on, on this uh, topic. Uh, what about industrial batteries, either appropriate batteries that will fit into the drum? Industrial, you mean uh, the car batteries? Yeah, so from electric vehicles. Um, you know, uh, for me, electric electric vehicle batteries. It's um, in my experience of work, it's another field for which I'm not too much um, for which I'm not too much involved at this moment. Uh, my when I do audits of site and facilities, it's for portable batteries mainly. Uh, electric, I know that people are doing a lot of, of work in these facilities that I audit about uh, dismantling those batteries. Um, I see Andreas has raised his hand, so maybe Andreas. Uh, Andreas is there, Bob. Good. Go ahead. Hi, Andreas. Here. Yeah, so uh, ADR has an exception for larger batteries, so it's important that the uh, shortcuts are avoided. So uh, basically, if there is uh, car batteries, large industrial batteries, they can be just fixed on a pallet, but it has to be made sure that there's no electrical shortcuts on the battery. So support mm -hmm. to be protected against shortcuts. So what is shown by Mario here applies really for 
portable batteries, small batteries, where it's actually impossible to uh, uh, avoid shortcuts, so you cannot put each single battery in a separate plastic bag. Okay, great. Then Mario, I think we should continue because time is, oh, lots and lots of thumbs up there, which is great. <laughs> <laughs> we, we we talk about damaged lithium batteries. Um, this is like a situation where um, uh, this you, you could see it eventually happening if you receive uh, electronic and bad, uh, bad, bad situation. Uh, so this, there are a way to manage this. There are... Uh, what is recommended is to to put them inside a bag and uh, put them inside a, a, a drum. There are some special drums that you can use, but you put them in a drum with vermiculite, and um, it it should stay there. Uh, and you can try to manage it as fast as possible with uh, your downstream vendors. Um, but for sure, it, it, it's risky. Like myself, if you ask me, Mario, remove that battery from this equipment, uh, you know, at the bottom of the image, <laughs> I would be afraid to do it. Honestly, I would be afraid that it will burn in my face. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's uh, this. This is the procedure, you know. You know. And sadly, if it's beginning to burn, if it's beginning to burn, you know, there is probably nothing you can do about it. It's probably the best way to think to do to get it out uh, and stay away from it. Uh, it will generate toxic gas, and um, after that, you can maybe recover the things and put it inside a, uh, a bath of salt water. Let it there for a couple of, of days to to make sure nothing will react after that, uh, and you have to dispose dispose it. Yeah. But it's a it's a safety risk, you know, with uh, some uh, phone with uh, glued batteries, it's uh, it's risky. For emergency situation, uh, we have identified some uh, type of uh, fire extinguisher that you can use for the, as an example for the lithium primary. Uh, you use class D that is good for combustible metal fire. Uh, yes, you can have like uh, some lithium primary uh, button cells if they are. Uh, sitting uh, inside a drum, a bunch of them with power, they could create an arc, eventually make a fire, a, fi a, metal, a fire of metal. Uh, so you use class D extinguishers, the extinguishing agent, it would be good. Um, if it's lithium ion, you can use a ABC dry chemical uh, fire extinguisher that is good for recognized for energized electrical equipment. Uh, there is also some companies that have developed special extinguisher for lithium fire ex explicitly. So I have a reference on this picture for you. Uh, for sure, <laughs> yeah, you, you need to prepare yourself. Uh, if you manage lithium ion batteries uh, or lithium polymer, yeah, it's uh, th there is always a risk of, of blaze. And, uh, so you need to think about it in your uh, emergency management plant. Uh, organize the storage and uh, be ready to fire, to fight a uh, fire. Um, also, if you are shredding batteries uh, yourself or shredding e-waste, this could happen as well in your in your shredder or in the fraction uh, outside your shredder. We have also fire in, in Europe in the e-waste waiting to be processed eventually. You will have some computers, laptops that will stay there under the rain and a pile, just waiting to be fed inside the hopper. They will be crushed and then the fire start. So we, we you need to be prepared about lithium. Uh, if you identify some batteries that can be reused uh, uh, and they are good cells, uh, I have been asked what what do I what do I have to do to make sure I can preserve them. So uh, the good batteries that can be reused, you should store them uh, away from sunlight, heat, and humidity, uh, a dry area mainly with a uh, cool temperature. That's the best way to to keep them for for a while. Now the the fun part, if I want to reuse for sustainability. Um, uh, a voltmeter is not expensive, and uh, with a voltmeter, eventually we can make tests of some batteries uh, to see if they are good or not. 
uh, as an example, uh, maybe um, uh, yeah, it's a mixture of, uh, of many types of batteries. Let's let's talk about primary batteries first. Uh, if it's good for alkaline, uh, they have acceptable look. Some people will receive portable batteries mix all together, uh, and eventually you can make a test to verify if uh, there are good batteries inside them. And this is applicable for uh, primary batteries, secondary batteries. Uh, mainly, uh, we know in Europe that some people are throwing good batteries. So if you get with a, a small voltmeter, you can measure the energy inside the batteries. Maybe uh, you can discard the ones that are not good anymore uh, of the ones that are average that could be used for lower consumption equipment or the good one that could be a market. And there are some batteries that have this kind of power check. It's very brilliant because you can see what remains inside them. And But for rechargeable batteries, uh, yeah, you could recharge them and verify if they can be used again, the, the, as an example, the, the lithium one. So there are some people also regarding uh, recharge uh, that have developed some system uh, for non-rechargeable batteries to be reused <laughs> uh, with some kind of uh, micro impulsion of current. Uh, they try to regenerate uh, primary batteries. So this system exists in France. It's based on a very old patent from Rayovac from 1980. Um, this will help eventually to uh, maybe save some money by saving some batteries. But I don't know if it really works. For me, it's more like, uh, looks like an alien, you know, um, <laughs> stuff. But based on this, Chinese companies has developed system that can uh, regenerate um, primary batteries, which kind of, uh, but the feedback, it's not very expensive, 15 euro, but the feedback of it from the web is that uh, it's risky, it's working for some type of battery with some kind of good residual voltage. Uh, there is a uh, possibilities to use, use primary battery a couple of times, they can be reused, but eventually they will leak. So this is really like uh, a solution that is, uh, I would not recommend anyway, it's, it could be risky. Secondary battery, then this is good because if you have a charger and like this type where you can measure and verify the, the content of the battery, you can verify also if it's taking a good charge. There is maybe a market to develop about uh, reusing uh, rechargeable batteries. I'm sorry, we were talking initially about uh, secondary batteries. We talk a little bit about primary battery, but it's all linked together. It's about the concept of, of reuse and uh, remarket some batteries. Like this charger here for 18 euro, it will help you to discover which one are acceptable and the one that are not very good. Repurposing for sustainability. Uh, this is in line with what we have just discussed recently. Uh, we, we have developed some project with uh, for Giz in, in Africa at the moment. We made a, a study. Uh, could we use some lithium uh, iron phosphate batteries uh, to be recovered and um, eventually reused uh, on the market? Um, that that was the idea. We we had uh, uh, an operator in Africa with a certain amount of batteries. Uh, it was like 60 ton of batteries. He has no knowledge of what was inside. Uh, we were looking for a solution to make this more like a, an, an opportunity to 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 make it valuable for the the, the operator. So we we have put the operator in contact with some uh, peoples. Uh, because there are many people in the market uh, that can uh, are working presently on the concept of re repurposing lithium batteries. Um, as an example, I talk about e-scooters. Um, I said to you, I said to you that the, the scooter they have a, a low life, uh, low span life, um, but the batteries could be very good. So this is the, the concept. You will take the batteries that are good and try to make something else with it, a new product. And the, the, I've put some name of company over there, uh, all based in the UK. These guys are 
and this process of repurposing, they will take lithium batteries and create from it new equipment, the uh, power banks that will uh, accumulate energy from a solar uh, solar uh, panel system. Uh, and after that, uh, you can connect yourself on it and uh, you can have power for your house uh, or for your in your garage. Anyway, you can connect on it, block your equipment, and you will have power to do what you want. OK. Uh, and also there is, uh, this is three companies involved with this type of batteries. There are many, many companies involved with the repurposing of uh, ve electric vehicle batteries. Uh, this is the big trend now. Try, try to find solution also to create big power power bank. The idea is that with the electric vehicle, you, uh, you have more batteries and, and volumes that you can handle uh, rapidly and maybe more capacity. Uh, there is many standard developed presently about this uh, repurposing, about safety and quality, so it's in development, and I would say this is a trend uh, to, to follow, you know, to, it's something, uh, anyway, for, for sustainability, it's a big opportunity. So talking about the pilot project, uh, uh, I said the, the, the African recycler had a stockpile of 60 ton of waste uh, lithium batteries, <clears throat> the goal here was to find an economic and ecological solution which can be readily replicated in other countries with similar waste fraction. So the first challenge was that the batteries were not sorted. They were somewhere in a building. And the first step was to sort in order to understand the composition and value of the battery stock. So uh, they, they, they measure the voltage of those batteries mainly. So uh, nominal voltage measurement uh, was performed and uh, it is known that for uh, lithium um, ferrous phosphate batteries, uh, the conventional uh, nominal, nominal voltage is 3.2 volt and multiple of these because you, you may have like uh, assembly of them. And for the lithium uh, cobalt, they have a voltage of 3.6. So with this kind of information, they were able to make a sorting uh, a certain step on the pile. So the results they got, they got from their sorting process was that only two ton of lithium cobalt oxide batteries, mostly from notebooks, were present inside the, the pile, and the rest was 58 tons of phosphate batteries from solar energy storage units. So uh, I, I said already that uh, Batteries with cobalt, they have a positive value. So it was a good news for two tons, but sadly, uh, I guess everybody would have hoped it was the reverse in the numbers. Uh, because the uh, lithium virus phosphate batteries, they are, uh, they don't have so much value. And uh, for the moment, you know, lithium, uh, I think a lot of people can recover lithium. It's possible to be recycled, but the incentive economically is not really there because it's easier to dig in the mine in China. Uh, so for the moment, those batteries, they represent a, a cost for the operator. So uh, the cost factor linked to the batteries are uh, logistics. It was uh, around uh, 3,500 euro for a 20 foot container plus some treatment fee. 1,000 euro per ton, and uh, we have made simulation for uh, the operator, and uh, the economic value of the uh, lithium carbonate cannot finance the shipment and treatment of the entire mix of batteries, so another solution is, was needed. The recycling of the uh, end-of-life uh, lithium ferrous phosphate batteries in Europe is cost-intensive, uh, so repurposing was considered with uh, a European partner specialized in battery uh, refurbishing. Uh, the company has experience in growing operation in East Africa. Uh, in order to evaluate the technical health of batteries on stock, 300 cells were tested by the African recycler using a Sky RCMC 3000 uh, equipment. It's a, it's a charger. If you enter this on the Google, you will, you will see it. It's a small unit. Um, although the test results were generally positive, uh, a more robust and detailed testing was just necessary. Uh, and this was uh, to be executed at the repurposing partner's facility 
using their, uh, their structures. Upon a successful test, uh, repurposing equipment will be deployed at the recycler facility to repurpose the remaining load. So second challenge, shipping batteries for further testing. It would be fun to ship the batteries, but uh, we understood that talking to the people over there that uh, it's a complicated process between those two countries and um, it was not that easy uh, to, to do. So potential gain from the repurposing project, economical aspect, the market of, uh, of economic value of the LFP batteries pack is, uh, so for refurbished batteries, you, the, the market is between 68 and 520 US dollar. And for the brand new one, it's 140 to 800 uh, US dollar. So one of the dependent factor associated to this is the size of, uh, of the cells uh, in the pack per pack in the normal capacity. Uh, we know that a cell weight is around 75 grams. Uh, so assuming that 60% of the cell in the 58 ton can be repurposed, the project brings positive value. And then for the ecological aspect, uh, the revenue generated can partially finance the logistic and treatment of the non repurpose 40%. Um, so there were some options to, to be investigated. Uh, the possibility of using part of the funds to finance the final take back of refurbished cells at their final end of life. Uh, a conclusive opinion here will only depend upon the quality of the total battery mix. So yeah, they, there are more tests to be done. So the, for the moment, we are in the middle of it, you know, it's not complete, uh, but we still need to find a management option at the end of life once these cells are completely dead, yeah. yeah. Uh, any question on, on this uh, pilot project? Or I will take the opportunity that Andreas is here because he, with his teams, they work on it more than me. So uh, if there is any question about it. So one question that was uh, left over from earlier was uh, if there are electric vehicle batteries coming in, should these be dismantled into the cell level to, to manage these at cell level? Do you have uh, any idea about this, Mario? Um, I'm not an expert, I'm sorry, about uh, vehicle batteries. It's, um, no. If I... I I would not like to give bad advice. Maybe Andreas knows more about yeah. it because you have seen some guys recently, but. Uh... Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's very difficult to say, give a general uh, answer on that. So on car batteries, the major market is reuse. So therefore, normally a car batteries, if it's not completely destroyed, um, it has a value. So therefore it should be handled carefully. Normally, the modules are tested individually and the good modules are resold relatively easy. So, on that, the, uh, uh, said that, normally the process for recycling of a car battery is depending on the technology. There are some technologies where the whole battery pack can be checked. Most technologies, the modules have to be removed and checked individually. So here there's no answer. It really depends a little bit on the on the process. But what I have to what I have to 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 really to to emphasize here that usually car batteries have a relatively high resale value. Therefore, re mm. re uh, re uh, reuse is always the first option. Only if reuse is not possible, or uh, um, recycling should be considered. And for recycling, it will be always done on module level. It has to be always discharge the battery. So then the typical process is removal of the module, discharging, and then the model is sent to recycling. Yeah. Daniel, for myself, November 24th, I will visit my first car battery recycling facility. So. Okay. I will know better after November 24th, which is not useful for you today. Sorry. <laughs> so you're, you're offering to give a, a follow up training on the <laughs> November 25th. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> um, there's a, a question as well from from Seth. Where can one get ver vermiculite uh, and what price? Do you, do you have an idea of this? Probably it's, it's very dependent on your local context. 
Yes. Uh, vermiculite. And we, should, we need to talk to recycler about that, honestly. Andreas probably knows about it because he has. Yeah, some... so let's say now it's relatively expensive. So recyclers prefer dry sand because it's much cheaper. Um, I think vermiculite typically uh, sex sack, which is 100 or 200 liters, costs 30 euros, something 30, 40 euros. So that is the price for 200 liters I'm, I'm aware of. Yeah. And it cannot, it cannot be recycled, I would say, I guess, because if it's contaminated by any leaks or I guess it's disposed, it's a cost of disposal. Thanks. So, uh, Basura, I, I unmuted you if you want to, to say your question. Yeah, thank you, Daniel, and hello, everyone. Uh, I just dropped the question in the chat box. Um, my question was, like, uh, is this solution that you piloted in another African country can be replicated at a really small scale level? And do you have any documentation um, available about that? Uh, I would say to do the testing of it, it's, it's probably quite easy. Okay. Um, after that, to organize the transfer of the batteries to a facility that can uh, refurbish them, then we, uh, we you need to establish contracts, contacts with the people in charge. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think we can replicate it. That's the idea of the concept anyway, to, to find a solution that can be replicated. Um, we probably uh, need we probably need to discuss together about it uh, uh, after you know. For the moment, I don't know if my colleagues have established a, a protocol or procedure, but there is probably a report given to um, prevent about it. Um, because I was not in, I, I, honestly, I was not involved in that in that part of the project. It, it has been done by my colleagues. We have Kingsley with his hand up, so King, Kingsley, go ahead. Kingsley, oh, is there? okay. Yes, so um, Mario, thanks You're for coming. <laughs> Do you hear me? So huh? great. So, uh, Bozura, regarding your question of replicating um, this same solution in in other um, African countries or countries with the same kind of um, you know waste stream or problems, mm -hmm. uh, it's fair to conclude that yes, it's a solution which is replicable. But of course, we need to investigate um, the volumes even at small scale, which you have uh, to be able to tailor it to this uh, type of solution, um, because there are different cost structures which are involved in that solution, and we have to match these cost structures to the volumes of the batteries you have to be able to conclude if um, you know the, 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 the total volume you have is, uh, is really fitting this, this, this type of solution. Okay. Okay. Great. So, but uh, to make sure that I understand, like the the, the batteries are not refurbished locally, right? Well, the solution is a local solution, so it can be the refurbishing itself. It's 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 it should be done locally, so to say. Okay. 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 So uh, we can we can talk about it later because um, the right. idea was not just for Senegal, but there's also a border country on which I, I'm working on and. Who is dealing also with with the battery, and they might be interesting as well. So let's talk about it later. Sure. So this is a solution which can be easily um, re so it can be relocated. So it's a, mm -hmm. it's a it's an equipment which can be which is mobile, and so mm -hmm. uh, that is why we believe very strongly that it is replicable. But of course, um, there is cost there which should be uh, related to the volumes of the batteries you have. That you cannot, yeah. Sure. Um, yeah so. sure. And what what is the average of the level of investment? Uh, well, it's a project which is still going on, and so we don't. Uh, this is a figure which I cannot just, you know, conclusive conclusively uh, name here or give you, right? Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. So we'll we'll have to, uh, I think, take this discussion. Probably it's a good one that we can continue in the prevent working group. Actually, how to to turn these these pilot ideas and and attempts into something replicable. And uh, there's a lot of interest in the chat right. from Egypt. How can we replicate this? So I think there's a lot of demand for this, and maybe it's something we can then follow up on uh, 
again in prevent but um yeah i think we're a bit tight on time so we plan yeah. to have a report in the next few months uh, which will give a bit of an overview of this this solution coming from prevent uh, and a follow-up we'll also have a report coming out looking at feasibility of shredding technologies as well for lithium ion batteries i think coming from our pilot project in nigeria so uh yeah if you follow prevent updates then you'll hopefully also see some of those those things coming forward but yeah, back over to Mario. We have 45 minutes, so I, I hope we can also get for the rest of the training as well. Yeah, let's start. We'll talk rapidly about lead acid, lead acid batteries because then we, uh, in this case, if you don't have in your area facilities able to manage it, uh, again, it's going to be more like export. Uh, but lead acid pollution, it, it's it's a big issue. Uh, it's the most polluting industry in the world, according to Pure Heart. We have put a link over there where you can read more about this. But uh, it has like a devast devastative effect on, on the health of many people. Uh, it's a poison. So you, we don't want to have you don't want to have this kind of batteries contribute to the uh, the harm done to local societies, communities. You know, uh, so. Those batteries should not be put in wrong ends eventually, and uh, so it had, there is a duty of care to put in place to make sure it's managed by proper people. So, uh, <clears throat> uh, so we know that you will probably not be engaged directly with uh, recycling them because to shred the uh, lithium acid batteries and manage the acid, the lead, it's uh, it's an issue. You know, it's a co big cost as well because you need a big plant, a big huge investment. So uh, you would probably need to work with a downstream partner for which you, you will maybe need to ask some questions. Uh, if you give it to the people who give you the more money, it's probably not also the, the best solution because you, you need to make sure it's good people. So duty of care should be the role managing these uh, because we don't want to have <laughs> the, the, uh, the lead finish in the, um, in the sewer, okay? So um, you, you need to perform duty of care. You should verify the people in charge of transport, the shippers and the end receivers, um, and to make sure that the people are following all the principles regarding environment, environmental health and safety aspect. So what do the, the people do normally when they, they uh, recycle uh, a battery, a lead acid batteries? Uh, in Europe, the guys, what they will do, they will crush the batteries to separate uh, the heavy lead material and uh, from the plastic, the polypropylene that will float at the surface of it, a plastic that is washed clean and recovered and can be recycled to create other batteries. Uh, the lead part uh, may contain some impurities, but they will be processed in uh, smelters that will manage to get it to the proper purity. Uh, the sulfuric acid, also need will be managed properly. They would, would be neutralized. Uh, could be neutralized with uh, baking soda, and uh, and it will turn uh, the, the acid uh, into uh, into water. Uh, and also, uh, the, the the people in general they are doing uh, like in Europe for the the battery recycling facilities. They are very <laughs> well controlled by the environmental agency. So. Emission, gaseous emission, aqueous emission, everything is controlled. So mainly, uh, yeah. And also, uh, with the sulfuric acid, you can convert it if you want to to make some uh, other uh, products, detergent, textile, uh, manufacturing, and also fertilizer. So, so this is like the lingot coming from the smelter. Uh, the, one of the good thing about the lead is that you can recycle it. Uh, Many, many times it will be good. No, it will not decline in the quality uh, over time. You know, it will uh, always be good for the doing other batteries. So if you have to make some controls of your operator in charge of batteries, you should verify their permit, transport storage for treatment, their capacity, can they accept more volumes? Do they have like a calibration scale to make sure that uh, you do proper mass balance? It should provide you proof of destruction of the batteries, uh, evidence of that. Uh, verify the storage practice before treatment. Uh, if you go on site and you see that it's leaking everywhere, it's giving you a good idea of the quality of the process. 
they should provide you data about the recycling and the residue they are pro uh, they are um, having at their at, at their output. Uh, you can verify the downstream vendors. Uh, yeah, you may think it's maybe too much controls, but you know it's ask question. People will tell you if they answer easily about the things, um, and they have some evidence, uh, they will not be afraid to show it to you that um, uh, they are doing the good job. Uh, and we talk about uh, monitoring of the emissions. Normally, also the chimney they have monitoring device with maintenance. Would they have system to make sure to not release uh, pollution in the atmosphere. You will see people using PPEs to protect themselves with uh, respiratory protection, mask, gloves, uh, equipment to avoid any burns from the, the heat of the uh, inside the smelters. Um, you will see if they take care of the people, if they uh, have some kind of health monitoring, in a way, emergency plan, communication with surrounding communities. So the Normally, the the the, the uh, lead smelter plant they are um, uh, not well seen by the community around them, so that's why they have to behave and they are so watched by the government and also they have good communication with communities to make sure that yes, we do the things properly. So things to be verified, and also they should have an impact study to verify the presence of aquifer on the area. Is there any animal reserve, agricultural feeds around? What is the impact on them? So. Yeah, this is the kind of things you need to change. And also, do they have a, a as up process? This is like the management of change. If they change something in their process, do they control the impact on the future on the uh, environment? These are the points to control. So, uh, yeah, you, you can make a checklist, discuss with them and go for it. Uh, <clears throat> uh, like the batteries, how, how could um, what, how do I cope with damaged lead acid batteries? Uh, you will sometimes batteries that have leaks. Uh, for sure, uh, handle them with care, not to get burned. So it's important. Uh, it's highly corrosive and could damage uh, clothing, irritate the skin. Sometimes, depending on the concentration, perforate the skin. Uh, it could cause metal corrosion. So uh, you need to 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 make sure that it's uh, properly clean. Uh, there is. Um, uh, if it's not immediately that you have like a, a symptom of burn, it could take some hours, you will see. So wash your hands, good hygiene, and also uh, probably uh, there is a necessity if there is a leak on the floor to uh, take uh, the, the leads on uh, neutralization of the, of the leaks with uh, proper uh, chemical products and wash the area mainly when it's neutralized. Um, so for sure, keep your hands and uh, away from your mouth and eyes if you ever touch to this, for sure. Um, yeah, and wear gloves. A safety shower is always a good thing also when you have lead acid batteries in the area. Yeah, this is what you need. Goggles, gloves uh, that could resist to um, chemicals. This one, they're not so good. This is more for puncture, but uh, you may have some one huge one that are you can fit until your um, elbows that are very good to avoid uh, to, to get burned. Yeah. Oh. Uh, safety shower uh, to have, uh, or it could be also so, some little bottles that you can have uh, specialized to, to clean the eyes, but safety shower and eye shower is very good to have in your facility to protect your employees in case of, it's not only a leak from acid could be also alkaline uh, alkaline products from the batteries, you know, so uh, it's always burning. This is a way to save the situation. Don't stock lead acid batteries on pallets. They may fall and spill. And if this if they leak, they will leak on, on the floor. You know, uh, it's it's better to have like container like this where uh, it's it's sealed. There is no leaks that could uh, eventually uh, be found inside the truck on the road, you know. This is what is the best containers to be used. Ah, question on lead acid batteries. If not, we go with portable. Bozura, you put your hand up. Go ahead. Yes, me again, sorry. <laughs> so I have a quick question. Um, 
like the, 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 the acid is is um, is a big issue and most of the time you see people and especially from the informal sector just um, leaking the acid and throwing away so is there any low cost alternative that uh, the acid can be managed before uh, shipping um, the battery actually without the acid to the recycling facility whether it's local or, or other. But I would say that if somebody wants to uh, try to uh, empty the batteries, you know, it, it's all associated to the risk about um, managing acid. Uh, it's a big risk to take. You can neutralize it with chemical products for sure. Uh, this is maybe something to think about if to have like a central, if you have a problem in a country where Nobody is, is doing uh, the, the perfect thing for it. Maybe it's an idea to establish a center point where somebody will put in place a process to neutralize the acid with chemical products. It could be done. Yeah, uh, and, and, but, and, and uh, there is there is also the problem of the lead contamination that uh, you you will have in the acid. We need to find a solution to handle this. Oh, this this is maybe the other point because there is still a presence of lead so you know so so yes it's possible to neutralize but still we will maybe have a, a problem of contamination uh, to handle so uh, it, it, there is more to think about than just say yes <laughs> we need to make a, maybe a, it could be a good project honestly to analyze what could be done see what are the remaining contamination and how we can handle it can we do something with it or not? Yes. Um, so yeah, so I, I'll reach out later maybe about the documentation on, on the process, uh, but because actually whether we do something or not, this is something that is happening. Uh, and the idea was to have a central point uh, where people can um, just empty the battery, neutralize the acid, and the question is how, and is it possible at a low cost level? and then what we can do with um, with this product. So if I come in there, I mean, I, I think um, projects that have looked at this in the past, for instance, from Oko Institute, there's been a number of projects looking at it in Ghana, and there it's actually the recommendation to export the whole batteries, including the acid, because it cannot be treated uh, locally or could not be treated locally. But if you are also able to find a local smelter that can manage the batteries it's reaching a high standard, then this could potentially be a different option. But I think we'll probably have to follow up with you separately on that, uh, Basura. Um, okay. As it's, it's, and, and I mean, we could have done three or four hours or three days on, on the acid batteries, but uh, we're just trying to give a bit of an overview on everything. Mm. Um, there's another question from, from Antenne. Um, can we extend battery life or remove corrosion through battery pulsing? My first initial reaction would be, yeah, doing a lot of stuff with lead batteries uh, in terms of repurposing is not as uh, simple as it is, uh, or let's say it's, it's less uh, recommendable than uh, doing it with lithium ion batteries. Mario, do you, do you have any ideas around this? No, I didn't study this aspect. I'm sorry. Okay. So Antenne, another question that we have to note down for Future it's also related to the fact that you know my uh, my specialty is is more like related to portable batteries with the recyclers I'm dealing with. I have seen in my life two sites for car batteries. Uh, one that was like a huge foundry where they were melting everything. It was quite impressive. And the second one that I've just seen enough and asking too much question have been kicked out. So. Uh, uh, well, I didn't see, I didn't saw so much <laughs> because I, I was asking the good questions <laughs> about the management. So, it, uh, yeah, I found a side that was not so good. Okay, so this is a point for us to follow up with, uh, potentially uh, going into a bit more detail on the lead acid batteries. We just wanted to give a bit of an overview here uh, and also give you an idea, okay, uh, what to look at in terms of downstream operators to be careful of, uh, because of course to set up a lead smelter it costs quite a lot of money to do it in a sustainable way. And we also want to avoid that it's going into these worst possible processes. So this is something to be aware of. But uh, Mario, what due no. to time, I, I think probably give back to you. I don't know if someone else just jumped in. Was it Andreas? 
Um, yeah, what I can just compliment on the reuse of lead acid. So <clears throat> it's basically not possible. So it would be possible if you have an industrial site for power uh, uh, pack where you have different batteries in parallel, and then you can maybe detect that only one is is defect. But normally, a used lead acid battery or the uh, lead acid battery which is not working cannot be reused anymore because it's just completely dead. Great, thank you. So back to you, Mario. Yes. Portable batteries. Um, particle batteries, we will probably concentrate on alkaline for the moment uh, because this is like uh, most of the load that we receive. Uh, some question I got from uh, the people of Giz. Can I throw all these in a bucket box without worrying about it? Yes, for the alkaline, no problem. They are tough, guys. Do they need to fully be discharged? No, no, alkaline, it's not a problem. Um, so, um, and the way they go in a plastic drum, big bag, plastic cages, metal drums with plastic inlay, uh, no problem. Can I send internationally the batteries? I have put a list of proposed sites at the end. If you want to deal with uh, a site involved with alkaline batteries, it's uh, written at the end of the presentation. Uh, what are the main separation I should aim for for an alkaline batteries? So if you want to, to shred them, then you will have steel and black mass in general. Uh, if you don't send it to cast iron production as a whole unit. Uh, but there are some issues if you shred the batteries again. Um, so button cell and single use alkaline batteries, where they, can they be sent? Uh, you can send them to a thermal process for pigometallurgy eventually, uh, where they will be cooked uh, and they will open and you will burn uh, the uh, external uh, uh, envelope of them, you know, uh, and you will get like uh, the, the, the black mass that will be released inside the oven. Uh, if there is presence of mercury, you need to make sure that the the oven is able eventually to recover any emission of it. So it's uh, there is some monitoring in the chimney. Uh, uh, there is also the cast iron production. There are some people using alkaline batteries to create uh, in special condition uh, some pieces of uh, brakes of uh, trucks, cars. Uh, this is developed in France. It's a company called uh, Battering. Uh, we'll talk about it later. There is some a slide about it. Uh, but uh, yeah, you can extract the metals and the black mass, but eventually the black mass needs to be used in the metal recovery process. So if there is none in your country, uh, then you will need to export the black mass. But uh, shredding a batteries with alkaline batteries, <coughs> uh, if you do it, uh, in an open air system, you will see that there is a nice odor that will come out eventually. It looks like uh, ammonia. It's not very uh, pleasant. And also, if you do it in an open air shredder, then you will get uh, a, a nice fine layer of dust everywhere in your building because the the dust from the the black mass likes to travel it, and it will put everywhere. You will look like a, a guy you work in a mine, you know underground mine if you stay in the area. So mainly uh, when you grind the, the, the alkaline batteries, you will get like a paper plastic fraction. If it's not metallurgical, if it's shredding, you, you will get like paper plastic fraction, a steel fraction in a zinc manganese concentrate. Uh, the zinc manganese concentrate can be used as a micronutrient and fertilizer uh, plants eventually. Uh, this is an, a possible option. I, I will. I have put on a slide elsewhere some names of company that are using uh, this black mass to create fertilizer. You just to say right now, you you don't throw black mass in the field like this and it's a fertilizer. No, you need to mix it with other elements that will like in a recipe to create something that is balanced. You know, with different elements. But uh, the zinc, you know, is is uh, very really appreciated for um, the fertilizer industry because <clears throat> there are some studies showing that uh, infertile soil they are missing zinc, and it's uh, mainly also because 
of the extensive use of the fields for agriculture at the moment, you're losing that, that zinc content, so it, it's a way to recover it. So the um, the, pa the paper, the plastic, and uh, is used for energy recovery in Europe. Uh, the metal can be sent for foundries for transformation. And the zinc manganese also can be sent for the zinc recovery uh, process. Like I said, I said over there, you know, there are some issues with the, the dust, <coughs> the other, <coughs> and also you may need to have some fire detection system if you have a shredder yeah, with sparks. You can have some uh, some boom sometime. <coughs> a shredder cost approximately, um, it's near 2 million euro for a small shredder of alkaline batteries. Uh, we have made some research about it. And this is for a treatment capacity of uh, 2.5 uh, tons. I'm sorry, I need water. <clears throat> uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, the other way around. <clears throat> so when you have a shredder and you have this kind of uh, air stream that is uh, smelling in a very bad ammonia odor, you may need also to, to clean it before uh, releasing it to the atmosphere. People in general install some bag filters that will uh, rec recover the dust uh, on the surface of some bags. In the bags, they are um, they will capture that dust uh, through some kind of a process. The, the the dust is removed from the bags and recovered in a bucket. And also uh, for for the quality of the air, uh, you can have. Um, what is quite common is a, a washing tower to to clean the air to remove the uh, the odor of uh, the ammonia. Okay, so after uh, after shredding, uh, there is generally a magnetic separation system that will allow removal of the ferrous fraction, which is around 16% of the mass, to be sent for recycling. Non-ferrous metal would be around 5% of the mass, so this is good number to know if you want to establish eventually. Uh, some income idea. The plastic, the paper, uh, it's around 2% of the mass. And so <laughs> the black mass is around 65. Okay. Innovative way for alkaline battery recycling. So black mass can be used for fertilizer production. Uh, I, we know that it's purchased at positive price by some societies. Uh, I've put some name there. There is Cameron Micronutrient in the US. Trace ground, uh, they are in um, Finland, and Anvirus stream is in Austria, uh, Australia, Australia. So, like I said, <laughs> they have some special recipe. I know that some people deal with them, uh, and they are creating fertilizer. The other idea that I like a lot is the uh, the idea to use full batteries, entire batteries, nothing to do on it and a kind of uh, creation, a cast iron production. So there are those engineers from France that has created this battering process where they can generate cast iron, brakes, pad disc, and motor parts of, uh, for companies such, uh, Scan such as Scania, Volvo, and Daimler. Um, I would have liked to show you a picture of the, uh, the parts they are creating, but I, uh, for copyright issue, you know I cannot. So you have over there the links to uh, some movies and also uh, the website of this company. Uh, I know, I know personally the guy who has developed this technique, and uh, I talked to him many years ago. I was surprised to see that he, he was he succeed a lot about doing this. So maybe what I can do, uh, I can provide to uh, Daniel uh, the contact name, and uh, I see with him if he, the, the gentleman is willing to discuss with to develop his process elsewhere. Because if you have in your area uh, a cast iron uh, production plant, then maybe the alkaline battery can go over there and serve to the manufacturing and development of some useful things, you know. So, uh, this is the pyrometallurgical pyrometa process. Uh, we are running out of time. So, it's written over there the condition of operation of, of this. and. Uh, 
uh, I will let you, uh, I talk about it a little bit already, but this is in more detail with where you see the temperature version needs to be very high. You will have some uh, the formation of uh, ferromanganese at high temperature and the zinc will evaporate in the atmosphere as a kind of fly ash that we can recover and from it uh, we can make some recycling, uh, reuse it for production. And also you will get some slags in the, 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 uh, the oven that can be used for other road production of uh, road aggregates eventually. But that's that's the main idea about it. And hydro metallurgical, it's the it, it's a process where uh, you will shred the batteries and eventually the, the black mass is treated in solutions where you will extract the value of it through physical acidic physical treatment, you know, to separate the elements. Uh, normally, uh, you use acid like uh, sulfuric acid, hydrochloric acid, and other type of acid, uh, mainly to, to to extract some value of it. Uh, F, maybe this is too much for today. Uh, all the uh, the the, um, <laughs> the specific reaction occurring, but at the end, what you need to understand is that we will transform the black mass that is made from zinc and manganese to two products at the bottom: the zinc sulfate that can be used to create uh, dye manufacturing, fertilizer, synthetic textile, medication, food for animals, uh, and also used in metal treatment. And the sulfate of manganese uh, by electrolysis, it can be transformed in uh, manganese dioxide, which can be used in new batteries. So hydrometallurgy is interesting because you have some possibilities over there that are uh, of there is a kind of closed loop, uh, but it's not coming without a cost. Cost. Uh, my knowledge of the European market for the moment, the hydrometallurgy plant, um, they are not so competitive. Uh, the black mass is going to some kind of, in general, is going to a very easy solution. Uh, there is a big plant in Europe that is using black mass uh, and metal recycling uh, industry with some kind of metal dust. Everything is transformed to create metals, you know. So, yeah. Sadly, it's not. Um, it would be nice to see more hydrometallurgical uh, industry to be um, competitive, but it, it, it is not. How do I cope with the damage I can in batteries? But everybody at home has probably have seen live this experience to remove an old battery from a, a, radi a radio that you forgot in the closet. So you touch it, it's like slippery, greasy, but in fact, it's like it's similar to caustic soda. It will burn your skin. So you need just need to wash it with a lot of water. Um, you, if you have some of them when you do sorting, uh, you just can leave them with the other alkaline. It's not a big issue in a way. The alkaline will finish at the uh, shredding process or treatment process. They will manage it. For nickel and cadmium, uh, nickel, nickel, hydro. Uh, we will not go in detail about them, but uh, these in general, they are managed in, um, in specific plant where they will be shred. And after that, they will go in some kind of specific oven where they will play with the temperature to try to separate some metals uh, uh, like zinc and cadmium at a certain temperature. It will be like uh, cooled down and recovered uh, in a way. So. Like I said previously, cadmium is an issue, so these are very complicated facilities with the high safety uh, mode to be enforced. So, voila. Collection and handling. <clears throat> batteries and any other types of batteries uh, that could potentially, could potentially contribute to chemical, uh, to the environment should be handled with care, so that's for sure. So we don't want to pollute the environment. So we use plastic drums when we collect them, and with, I would say uh, because they are mixed, uh, to ship them when you have some lithium, I use metal one. Uh, for the alkaline, <clears throat> uh, I, like I said, uh, some people are using big bags to transport them. It's kind of, uh, it's, uh, it's easy to use for them because then they deter them over the process and uh, they get rid of the bag after. Uh, regarding the issue of the management of the drum, uh, <clears throat> how do we work with suppliers about <clears throat> managing the drums? Uh, personally, I don't know. 
Maybe my colleague Andreas knows about it because he has a lot of contacts with the recyclers. Uh, this is maybe something to discuss uh, apart. Uh, but in general, use containers that are <coughs> sound, sealable, not damaged or leaking. And also label them, it's important. Uh, keep them closed and sealed <coughs> and protect them from the weather. You don't want to have rain inside them. Best practice. <coughs> Establish a storage plan with a plan with identification of hazardous and risky waste. <coughs> it's always good to uh, share this with the local fire brigade. You know, if there is a fire event, at least they know where are located the, the risky stuff. Uh, train your people on the safe handling of them. Uh, and make sure so that only uh, authorized people should access the area. Just make sure that they don't create a mess. Uh, make sure that you don't stock more batteries than you're allowed uh, legally. And using drum, that's a good issue. <coughs> I'm sorry. If you are re reusing drum, you make sure that the drums, they are not uh, dirty, that they are the good class to be used. Uh, that they are dry, for sure, that they are not damaged or rusty. Uh, that's uh, it's it sounds stupid as a recommendation, but I've seen situations where people were stocking e-waste and drums with a lot of uh, of uh, petroleum glue. You know, uh, it it was not making sense. So everything can happen. <coughs> if you if you clean your drum inside, then manage your water properly. <coughs> I'm sorry. Any question on portable batteries? I know I've been quite fast on this one, but uh, uh, everybody is there? Or I'm yes, alone? we're st we're still here. I'm just uh, trying to figure. So we have a question from Sarah. Is it the black mass from alkaline batteries that has positive? All the alkaline batteries. Uh, I'm thinking. Positive value is probably the question here. So uh, I would, no, I, I would not say that uh, the black mass has a positive value. Um, no, I, I would say, uh, and I'm sure Andreas will confirm it, that some people will take it, you know, uh, at, at low cost, you know, uh, just, yeah. <laughs> Um, because th there is things to do on it. Again, it's uh, um, the process of shredding the batteries, the safety that you you have to put in place for the treatment of the air um, to avoid to have the dust release. There is a cost associated to this as well. And um, um, yeah, there, so, there is no positive value. So I mean, yeah, just yeah. Go ahead, Andres. Yeah. Just to give you some ideas here, typically, in, if you ship larger volumes, processing costs of the gate fee, you mm -hmm. have to bring four complete alkaline batteries on the magnitude of 300 euros in Europe, and black mass uh, below 100, so something between 50 and 100 euros. So there you're meaning if if you bring per ton of, of alkaline batteries, uh, it would be 300 euros to give it to a, a recycler to treat this. This would be how much it would cost you. Yes. Or 100 or 150 euros per ton of black mass yep. if you've already shredded yep. it. Yeah, OK. So I mean, Mario and Andreas, I mean, where does this leave recyclers? Let's say you've got a lot of batteries in your in your yard like this. They were, you've sorted them. You've got a kind of decision to make, right? Do you try to send it abroad? Do you try to set up a process here? I mean, it seems like a shredder and beyond costs uh, several millions. If you have a high volume of batteries there, um, what would you say, just from a practical point of view, the, the best approach would be, would it be to kind of look for iron production in your local area and see if this can be sent there? Or, or would you just say to export? Me, personally, uh, when we look at alternative solution that is, um, that is good, you know, locally, 
I think the solution of uh, to use it in cast iron production seems very interesting, but it depends if you have the facility in the rear. Uh, there is maybe a possibility to to have a deal to have them process it. You know, uh, 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 yeah. And uh, for the fertilizer, uh, I've been told by uh, recyclers that it's possible to sell the black mass with. Uh, a positive cost. It's it's not a big cost, um, a big price, you know. Uh, but I, I I can I can see to <laughs> I can see here what is what it is. I know what it is, but I can see it. Just um, <clears throat> confidentiality, you know. Um, but um, will it cover the cost of transport uh, to these countries far away? You know, we talk about USA, Finland, Australia. It's not nearby. So we need to check, is there any fertilizer industry in, in Africa or, or in your area, in Asia? Yeah, there is also people from Asia today. Uh, so there is maybe something to, to think about. Uh, yeah. Maybe to complement yeah. here, the, 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 the uh, uh, cast iron industry is definitely a very interesting uh, option. But also in Europe, it's a niche market. So even a relatively large uh, 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 foundry can maybe consume 500 tons of batteries. So that is the maximum capacity. So in Europe, it's a, it's a perfect application, but for a very limited amount. So basically, there's much more waste batteries than outlet available. So uh, if there is a, 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 a cast iron uh, operator, it's always interesting to maybe to, to approach him and to see in the which condition he can consume those batteries because that is always an economically financial attractive solution, but it will be the exception. So then it comes down to kind of trying to figure out how you finance the treatment costs and uh, looking at kind of the export options then probably. Right, because generally speaking, there's always a cost associated with, with the battery. So otherwise you have to be lucky. So general assumption have to be that battery recycling is associated with the cost. Okay, great. And yeah, Mario, I, re I realize I'm taking up your precious time. So I give back <laughs> to you uh, the word. Least there is participation so it's interesting so for me if we go more than after five ten minutes so it's not a problem we, we will do it so general topic for transfer um, so mainly uh, discussing with my colleagues uh, you can use 60 liter drums 120 liter drums or 220 liter drums uh, when you move things around you know uh, inside your country for distance transport, for sure, the the 220 liter is the best. Um, but generally, the metal drums are usually used, you know, class two for um, exp exporting of, uh, especially uh, the lithium batteries. Uh, we already discussed that we need vermiculite, internal plastic bag, 200 micron micron. Uh, it's also possible to use other comp uh, containers uh, in special types of box pallets, but you need to see the ADR packing condition. Uh, we will talk about ADR now, uh, and everything depends on the type of battery and the battery capacity. Okay, but for nickel, metal hydro and alkaline, if they are sorted, the big bag is uh, is considered sufficient, and anyway, for the movement we do here in Europe. <clears throat> so the, the transfer of batteries must follow the control procedure based on the Basel Convention. Okay. Uh, donc, uh, you need to make sure that uh, the, the waste battery would be sent to a proper recycling treatment, that there is a disposal or a disposal or management facility. Uh, eventually, uh, the, the waste needs to be properly uh, classified, uh, identified on the package, with proper labeling, and then you need to develop uh, the manifest, the transport documentation, to make sure it can uh, go to the destination. Uh, there is so some procedure to be applied regarding this movement. Uh, there are many rules also that you need to check depending of the type of transportation that will, you will use. 
for the moment, I would say that in our case, uh, I consider that road and marine is probably the, the best option for uh, the zone that we are looking to help. Um, uh, so uh, mixed batteries are considered as as other waste. Uh, so we have uh, in Europe what we call EWC, European Waste Code. <coughs> These type of batteries are given are given a, a code number, and uh, we'll see it on the next slide where it's it's said if it's considered as others or not as others. Uh, but in the case of the lithium batteries, they are considered none as others, but they need to be shipped with by strict ADR rules, which is, which is a kind of very strange, you know. It's it's not that it's not as others, but it's really dangerous. <laughs> Mainly, this is what it is. Uh, so I have put a link for the uh, ADR files over there, 2021. Uh, this, this is for you to you can go over there and download the documentation uh, where it is explained all what you need to do. Uh, I will go through a brief uh, information about it in the next slide, you will see. But at least you have the link to get the information in, in Russian, very interesting, uh, in English and in French. European Waste Code, so for the mixed battery 20133, you need to know that because if you are looking to export batteries to Europe, you will need that, that type of information. So before sorting, if you set them mixed, it's going to be this code, which is considered as others. And after sorting, you have all the chemistry over there. The one with a little star means that they are as others batteries. Alkaline is not as others. There is no star. Same for what we call other batteries and accumulator, including uh, nickel, nickel metal hydrure and lithium ones. And there are more codes under development. I've seen some pass recently from uh, Spain. Some other codes are coming specific to lithium ion batteries. So it's interesting to follow what will happen in Europe regarding this because uh, will we see the uh, venue of new codes uh, to be followed? Mainly. So I said the lithium battery is not as of this, so you can use the uh, they are green list. You can use the Annex 7. I have attached here a link to the uh, Annex 7 that you can uh, take a look at and download. So mainly an Annex 7, it's a form that say, uh, I am the producer, uh, I have my carrier, I have my destination. We are moving this amount of waste with a description. Uh, and this needs to be shown at the, at the border, you know, uh, for the people in charge of the, the border to to see the movement of the uh, of the waste and the uh, the guy in charge of uh, people sign on the list and they will uh, confirm that it have been moved that they have been processed stamp a date voila this is the way to go if not uh, if you want to make uh, if it's hazardous then you need to go through the uh, tfs process <coughs> where uh, mainly the way it's going uh, there is also a source at the bottom of, of the page explaining where it's coming from. Uh, so you have a generator of a waste that is considered uh, as others. Imagine you want to move uh, lead acid batteries. Uh, so you will establish uh, a contract with a disposer, uh, a contract specifying uh, ESM. ESM means uh, environmentally sound management uh, process. So it, yeah, you have to establish uh, some rules and the contract that says it will be managed properly. So the uh, the generator will inform the government uh, of the country that wants to export that they want to do a movement. The country will inform the country of import that there is a movement going. And also you have, there are some notifications to be sent to the country of transit. Uh, so they will refuse or allow the, uh, the export, those government authorities. If there is a, a consent or denied, then they would inform the generator. OK. Let's, let's imagine it's go, it has been approved, so the disposer will send uh, documentation to the generator and the country of export explaining uh, that there is a movement going on. So the document will be uh, attached to the, uh, the transporter, uh, the trucks, 
would move around. It would be verified by all the country, country in transit and the final country. <clears throat> At the end, when it would be uh, processed, the disposer will confirm the destruction of the things, uh, of the waste, and it will uh, send the information to the country of export. And uh, well, it has been done. So uh, yeah, the, the TFS process, uh, it's not free. There is a cost associated to this, uh, as I understand. You can establish as well uh, with your operator uh, uh, and your TFS. I will manage, uh, let's say, for the next on the next two years, I will do 25 shipment of X tons of batteries, and the TFS is good for that period for the number of shipment and the tonnage uh, that you call at the beginning. So you can have like an open TFS system. And you have to manage all your shipment and the documentation to prove that you have made uh, your duty with the material that has been sent for treatment. Voilà. <clears throat> ADR. ADR, this is the rule for the road in Europe, mainly. And then uh, over there, it's a big, big tick document. The number of, pie of pages is impressive. But uh, I have extracted for you here uh, the information related to the, the, the battery that are probably the most interesting for today, the lithium ion battery and the lithium metal batteries. They are, they are class nine uh, batteries. Uh, so there is a specific label developed just for them because you, they show battery with a little fire. So it says it all. Uh, so uh, for the lithium batteries, you will see that there are some special provision to be respected in packing instruction. So uh, what does that mean? That means that if you go in the ADR document, uh, you read those special provision and instruction uh, for packing, you will know what you can do with those batteries, okay? And you have also to take a look at the uh, maritime code for the, the transport. Uh, today, I didn't have the chance really to look at it, uh, this is also maybe like uh, it could deserve some, uh, if you want to export by boat, it could deserve a, a nice training as well. Um, but for the, for the moment, yeah, this is by road. This is what you can use. Uh, so uh, the special provision, what they are about, mainly they are paragraph inside the, the IDR rules that would explain to you what is related to the lithium ion batteries. Here, Lithium batteries for disposal or recycling. I have extracted the information. You see, they give you some idea of what you need to do. And also they say that the packaging needs to be. They will tell you uh, what you need to do regarding uh, labeling, the size of containers, um, uh, what you can send, uh, when, based on the type and capacity of batteries. So there is plenty to read, honestly, plenty to read. It, it will depend on the of the type of battery you have in your hands, you know, is it coming from vehicles? Is it coming from uh, uh, like portable batteries or uh, used batteries, damaged batteries? There are many things to read to to be aware of what you can do with them. And for the the packing uh, provision, uh, packing instruction, these are the main one here. I have uh, I have gave you also the link. And I gave you the page <laughs> so you can go directly because when you begin to dig in it, you will see it's, it's quite huge. Uh, but mainly they will tell you which kind of drum to use. Uh, the, they will talk about uh, the plastic inlay inside the drum. A lot of things that we already discussed mainly, but this is like state by the government and also uh, by, by this organization. Uh, also, uh, there is some re uh, regular update of these, so you need to, um, to to be aware to look on a regular basis to see if there is any change made about this. So uh, you always verify if you have the latest information regarding what you need to do and discuss discuss with the end receiver for details because these people, they are the specialists. They are the one who receive a lot of them presently. Uh, they, they probably know more than me regarding what you can do what you can use as a container, what are the rules for labeling, because associated to this, if you don't do the proper thing, 
uh, then you would be snapped on your hands by the uh, some authorities. Uh, you, there are some fines if you don't do the proper things. So it's important. And finally, the last slide. Uh, a, a lot of names of people that uh, I know uh, and then uh, that are processing batteries. Uh, so you have over there, if you click on the on the links, you will get to their website. You will get information available from them. Sometimes look in the, in the, the files for documentation. People are providing over there uh, description of their process, recycling efficiency, uh, good information about health and safety. So many things that you can uh, extract and learn from these people because they are the real expert. You know, they are the one who are doing this processing since so many years now. Uh, it would be nice to put them in contact with you eventually to to develop your activity. It would be nice. What well, Daniel, this is the uh, my last slide with five minutes late. I'm sorry about this. Oh, fantastic, Mario, and thank you so much for surviving. I was worried that you might lose your voice in the middle, but uh, this is a really great great training. Uh, I hope um, as well a lot of uh, useful insights for everybody listening today. Um, there was one question from the beginning that I just want to go back on to from the lithium ion batteries. So there was the question, should lithium metal batteries and lithium ion batteries be sent separately in a transport? Do you have any insights on this? But they, they have they have different UN code already. Uh, you saw uh, uh, go back. Lithium metal batteries. They are UN 3090 and the other one are 3480. So they have. <clears throat> so it means that they have some different packaging instruction and provision for the the transfer. So you you cannot really mix them together. Uh, uh, it's not shown over there, but you have also the case uh, of lithium batteries, uh, stock and equipments. You may have, uh, I don't know, a, a huge uh, drum of uh, battery uh, of phones with batteries inside them that you you decide finally, okay, I will not remove them because I will get somebody. Um, so you have you may have a drum of uh, lithium batteries contained inside an equipment. There is a special code for that. I believe it's uh, 3091 or 3481, one of them. 3481, I guess. <coughs> yeah. Okay, great. Thanks for this. And I think the other thing to bear in mind is even if they're not necessarily uh, classified in Europe as hazardous wastes, uh, some countries also define their own hazardous wastes, and then all of these need to follow the Basel Convention um, hazardous waste uh, routines, which can cause a bit of a headache. We're also working on a position paper in prevent together with step on the problems with the prior informed consent procedure and, and the timings it can take for uh, authorities to reply, um, which makes all these transports a lot more difficult. Um, and we're hoping to kind of try to, to find solutions for that as well. OK. Um, are like there any? The yeah, sorry. Like right. The people listening at me and I hope I didn't create too much confusion and um, because we speak fast and uh, um, but uh, yeah, I remain at your disposition, Daniel, if there is any questions, so don't worry. So I think um, at this point we can probably close, but we can maybe just stay on for another five to ten minutes for any residual questions. Uh, I think it was a fantastic training, Mario, so thank you so much for the time you put into this and um, being there today and answering these questions. And it's, it's a very big topic, but I think uh, this is the first training I've seen at least uh, where we've managed to give an overview of, of all the different aspects. Of course, the focus was on sorting, classification, identification, and a bit, you know, what you can do with these. So I think there were some questions around the treatment uh, technologies. Probably these are some areas for further research, further action from some of the international organizations also on the call today. How can we support the development of some of these local um, actions a bit more as well? 